calling together the uh, board meeting of the Honolulu Authority for Rapid Transportation. It is Thursday, September 29, 2016. We are at Kapolei Hale, and it is about 9.05 a.m. Let us first begin with public testimony on all agenda items. Uh, the first name I have is Barbara Armitrop. But Barbara, are you going to do your usual, which is testify when you want, so you'll signal? So you don't want to testify now, right? Okay, thank you, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> we, we just communicate by hit <laughs> and whatever. Okay, Michael Kumuka Kaoha Lee. I hope that's an H versus an L. Michael Lee. Mahalo, Chair Hanabusa. My name, as you correctly pronounced it, is Michael Kumukao Oha Lee. I'm a recognized uh, consulting party to the PA programmatic agreement in the Kako'o five years uh, coming to those meetings. Uh, recognized lineal descendants for the Ivi Kupuna in this area. A recognized cultural descendant by OIBC and SHPD for all the EV and the heart rail as well as in this area. And a recognized Native Hawaiian cultural practitioner for this area, <clears throat> and we have uh, registered in SHPD Section 6E uh, a burial site registration of our family shark god cave, Ivikupuna. This was clocked into SHPD August 10th. It shows exactly where the location of the cave is under the Ho'opili train station. And this is no, he made it up 10 minutes ago. We engage with Matt McDermott, your archaeologist, since November 12, 2011, five years ago, and even before then, uh, in numerous emails telling him about our family site of the Shark God Caves with our Ibi Kupuna on the Ho'opili site with uh, maps. This never got into the um, AIS. Uh, we testified in the Land Use Commission as the witness under oath uh, April 4th, uh, 2012, four years ago. Same thing, family Ivi Kupuna. I was the guy who sued Haseko Inc.'s billion dollar um, Eva Marina project, and I proceeded my own case to the state Supreme Court, defunding from Deutsche Bank the billion dollars for that project because I showed in my briefs that I used the shrinkage of the marina to get in to show their banker that if they decided to break through in the proposed Eva Marina channel, this is the evidence I would bring to court. I cost them several million dollars in the eight year process. Now, what uh, OHA has done yesterday has, as beneficiary, they are going to ask and petition for a new supplemental EIS for the hard rail because of Honolulu Uli Gulch's uh, there's pueo in there and the endemic endangered damselfly, which is on the federal fisheries and wildlife endangered list. OHA, uh, through Kamanao Crab's office and Kai Markel, manager of compliance and enforcement, uh, will petition the Office of Environmental Quality to do a supplemental EIS for a heart rail through the sites of Honouli Uli Gulch, the uh, East Oahu. Um, by the uh, new uh, guideway there and throughout the Ho'opili area. We have brought <laughs> substantial evidence that shows the existence of these rare endangered species, the Pueo Owl for the state uh, endangered species list and the federal endemic uh, red orange damselfly. Also, in that, that um, uh, land use commission for DR Horse, D.R. Horton's attorneys that recognized me as the Native Hawaiian cultural practitioner in this way, in this area. Um, I brought to heart in our Kakao meetings um, where you have the guideways that significant sinking is taking place and mitigation was done last year to fill up the sinkholes in the area of the Hono Uli Uli Historic Bridge next to the Behavioral Health Center, Kahimohala. It was featured in Catherine Cruz's report uh, back in August 6th. We have asked for a continued monitor, and we petitioned OHA, who brought out Kai Markel, who is coming up with a report for Office of Hawaiian 
Affairs Manager of Compliance and Enforcement that these mitigation efforts for the for the health and safety of the general public were not enough and continual monitoring needs to be done because the mitigation of putting, uh, I'll, I'll let you have these pictures and you can pass them around, they're, they're yours in evidence. Um, the mitigation was to put blue rock in sinkholes eight feet deep, now the blue rock is sinking. That was last year's mitigation in 2015 in September. May of this year, they're sinking where Catherine Cruz put a ruler and it disappeared. And we're saying right below there is two bus stops where people stay and if we have on the books from NOAA that this year is going, is a La Nina year. Significant rain event is gonna take place in our area. This has happened every 10 years. In 1996, 14 inches of rain. In 2006, people could not pass through because of 12 inches of rain falling by the golf course next to Queens Hospital. Now it's 10 years after that, it's 2016, La Nina year, expected to be a heavy rainfall. The last two years, 14, 2014 and 2015, were El Nino years, extremely dry. Um, this is, I'm gonna let this pass around, this is my registration burial, it's for your, okay. So the information for, about the damselfly and uh, the Kupuna Caves, uh, this is my letter to Sierra Club. That's also to be entered into record. Um, I have found that going to the five-year Kako'o meetings that were set up, it's now being shut down. Kanihili Cultural Hui, which I'm a part of, we bring significant Hawaiian issues. In fact, the only present Hawaiian consistently going for five years. They have isolated us from the regular body. We used to meet as a consulting group. Now we are isolated from the consulting group. We do not get regular minutes to our meetings. We have to tape our own meetings. We are not being facilitated by Ka'ako Tu'u Trisha Watson. Our request for meetings, she's now gonna hold a meeting for the entire group starting October. We used to have quarterly meetings with the general body of consulting parties. It is a total shutdown. After I went to OHA and made a stink about all of this, she started to hold a meeting now. And uh, this is a gross um, violation of due process under the Heart PA, especially stipulation 12B, which because of our recognized EV uh, issues and recognition by OIBC under Section 6E DLNR, we are being denied the recognized seat at the table we have. She will, everything we put in for our agendas, she refuses, and here's copies of what we asked for. She reads the stipulations as this does not belong in the meeting, and according to programmatic agreement stipulations, we, we as consulting parties have the right to put this. Uh, what we want is the agenda. And she claims in her interpretation, no, it doesn't go. There's no due process within this, uh, this, this procedure which will lead to a lawsuit. And I can per se a lawsuit as I did with Eva Marina. We won at, um, against Haseko Eva Inc. for the Papipi Road drainage under Judge Eden Hifu, AKA Bambi Weil. We won in the Kolo'i Gulch case in now First Central uh, Circuit Court. Um, going through for EIS for Kolo'i Gulch. We don't want to do this. My record is partnerships and alliances. We just have to sit down and just like human beings talk it out. We are being shut down from doing that in this process. And that's why I'm making an appeal directly to the board and you, Chair Hanabusa, to please hear what we're saying and uh, do a fact finding um, on these uh, charges that I'm making. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Members, any questions of Mr. Lee? Thank you very much. John Bond. Uh, good morning, aloha. Aloha. Chair Hanabusa and members of the board. Um, I'm here today to uh, sort of harp on things that I've brought up before in past testimony, but it's interesting that in the news today, uh, says that scientists say world likely won't avoid dangerous warming mark 
global temperatures will hit dangerous warming levels in about 35 years. But, of course, this is already happening. And uh, we're seeing massive storms coming by all the time, and we're going to get more of them and bigger all the time. Um, so heart rail is in building planned stations and TODs in what is identified as uh, tsunami evacuation zones. And they had already been identified as such in 2010 before any heart rail construction was started. So nothing ca they can't say that they didn't know about this or it wasn't documented because it was. It's on the city website. Uh, those, ex those tsunami zones have since been greatly expanded inland. So um, the point of this is that when the big disaster hits, whether it's a tsunami or a hurricane storm surge, um, it's going to take out the incredibly vulnerable home, uh, wastewater treatment plant of Sand Island. So nobody's going to be able to flush their toilets downtown for a long time. And so that should be priority number one, is to move that to a safe location. Uh, it's just a massively vulnerable disaster. Um, Hurricanes like uh, so, uh, typhoons that recently hit just in 2013 was a huge one in the Philippines, killed 6,000 people. Um, the city that got hit is just like Honolulu. Honolulu is just an incredibly wide open uh, south shore uh, hurricane storm surge disaster ready to happen. It's just there's no protection for it. All these hurricanes that come by don't even have to hit Honolulu. All they have to do is push storm surge in, inland. Uh, 30, 40 feet, you have the effect of a tsunami going on for 12, 15 hours. So you're going you're to lose tons of infrastructure. Everybody that's building in downtown is going to lose a lot uh, of infrastructure. Okay, so uh, at the recent uh, World Conservation Congress, uh, Dr. Chip Fletcher, who's an expert on sea level rise and um, all these subjects, has already said it's too late already. They said, you know, the idea of stopping this or somehow they're going to do something, everybody's going to turn off their lights and refrigerators and uh, it's going to not happen. This baloney, everyone's agreed, this is coming. You know, get serious about this. And that's what he's been saying for a long time. So he's saying now that his previous estimate was about three feet. He says it's going to be at least five feet. And he's still very conservative on sea level rise. So you're going to see rapid sea level rise. You're going to lose all your infrastructure along the coast. Everything you're talking about building now is going to be a waste of money. You're going to lose it all. The, um, and we brought the, up before in testimony that the Federal Emergency Management Administration, the National Flood Insurance Program, Title 44, Executive Orders uh, 11988 and 13690 have all said that uh, any project should uh, identified uh, in flood zones or these disaster areas should not be built in those areas. So you're going against everything all the federal directives and pre uh, presidential directives to continue doing this. Okay, so, um, and just for, for, to let you know too, this whole project, you know, really has been nothing but a huge fraud from the beginning, going all the way back to when Romy Cachola voted, we all voted for uh, the, um, the other uh, road uh, through, um, I can't remember now, but I, it's, it, it was done to get the rail vote, and then it was put down by the airport. The airport area, all of Lagoon Drive, as we've seen from all the rainstorms, is a flood area. All the, the so-called um, mid Middle Street areas, all flood zones, it's going to be wiped out. Um, there was no cultural monitoring during any of the West of Oahu-Farrington Highway section, um, and Dan Grabassus at the time said, nope, we're not going to spend any money on it. So that was a big fraud too. There was all the Evian caves that we know were out there, and we've documented this, were destroyed uh, largely because they refused to do any cultural monitoring. And that's a fact. Okay, so then we've since found to the uh, existence uh, of the fact that the EIS was fraudulently done on many things, farmland conversion reading, um, that was a big fraud. Uh, the studies were done, people consulted, and to get rail to go through just for a guideway was sort of okay, but they just basically used that as a, a mechanism to uh, say that none of the land at Ho'opili was valuable farmland. And every study by the state and everyone else has all proven that's totally false. So the Poyo survey was falsified. Um, so as we go down the list here, um, the number of <laughs> fraud is just too much to even talk about here. We, I've got lots of documentation, but. So it's a waste of time what you're going to be doing here. Pretend like you're going to 
take um, this rail through either Dillingham Boulevard or even if you had go down Nimitz, you're going to have to do a new SEIS. It's going to trigger all kinds of things. Um, my personal suggestion is you really should just stop this thing at Aloha Stadium. That is your best bet. That's the place that you could network buses on to different locations and to over to the windward side and everything. That would be the logical place to stop this thing and, and save people billions and billions of dollars because it's just a fake going downtown. You're going to encounter so much worse stuff than what you're even talking about here with a Kiwet and all the shim problems and pads and everything and corrosion. It's going to be ten times worse than that. But so I'm going to leave you with a happy note. So my happy note for you is that years ago, uh, Dr. Uh, Panos Pravideros had a, pro, um, a concept for getting cars downtown very inexpensively. And I sort of uh, took that idea and made a proposal back in 2011, January 2011. It's the Eva Coppola Commuter Traffic Alternative, Pearl Harbor Channel, Vanpool Express Bus Ferry. Um, I'm going to give this to you folks. I don't know if anybody will even want to read it, but the fact is, for an incredibly low amount of money, you could have a lot of cars going across Pearl Harbor. The Navy would not be against it because it would be all run by Navy contractors that park all the aircraft carriers and destroyers. This is an incredibly well-vetted plan. It would use the same type of ferries that Washington State uses. If you've ever been up there, they run an incredibly efficient ferry system. They run through Navy bases. I mean, all the things. In fact, this plan was so good, I was called up by Wayne Yoshoka at the time with head of DTS and told to shut up. And he actually called me at my home and said, stop talking about this because it was a threat to the rail project. Uh, that was, and I was a pro-rail guy at that time. I said, wait, are we talking about getting people off the highway and saving money and time? And No, they aren't interested in that. They're interested only in spending endless amounts of money on a big fraud. So with that, I'll just end that, but I'll pass this along to you. And say there is an alternative, and it could be done on a short amount of time. And you could get a lot of cars off the freeway. And it would work for all the military workers at Pearl Harbor and Hickam and even Tripler and everything could use this. Um, I've talked to military people off the record and they all really liked this idea, but it was politically squashed. So, Ms. Hanabusa, would you go back to Congress? Will you please look at doing this? Because it's a really good idea. And I think that could be one of your star things you could do for everybody out here. Thank you, Mr. Bond. So thank you very much. Members, any questions of Mr. Bond? Yes, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Hall. Thank you very much for coming. It was a lot of valuable time coming and driving all the way out here. I respect your professional opinion uh, and your research because I kind of believe some of the things you're saying is the truth. Uh, I've been a first responder. I also lived in the area near the airport, in fact, right where the terminal was. My grandmother's house was right on Airport Road. And in 1946, when they had that tidal wave, we had to evacuate. And the only method of evacuation was on the old ORNL railway that had a trestle over that middle street stream there. And that was the only way we got out of Damon Track was via the railroad. But my question is, an elevated railway, would that still be susceptible to a tsunami? Well, you have to realize that, sir, that um, people have to get to the railway. And so bottom line is they, they have to uh, arrive and park somewhere, either on a level or sub-level area. So all that's going to be flooded. So the rail guideway will still be there as the big waves come through. But all your infrastructure, your power systems, and electrical boxes, sewage, everything is going to be destroyed. So you'll have a totally useless railway. That, that won't be used by anybody because all your infrastructure beneath it is, is gone. Just a bunch of concrete pylons there. And in fact, it'll probably, uh, and the worst thing is it's not even usable as an emergency evacuation. And, uh, uh, the thing that works in emergencies are buses because you can take buses and drive straight up to the mountains to get everybody get on board and head for the hills. That's the way it would work. You can't do that with rail. Every, everyone's going to have to evacuate all the stations and get out of there. And you're going to lose all the sub-infrastructure uh, at level or below ground. So it's a huge waste of money to do that, you know. Um, so that would be my, my answer to that. It's just logical that you're going to lose all so of that. So the guideway would be secure, but the infrastructure would 
the guideway would probably not go be gone, but by the time you lose all your infrastructure, it'll be useless. It won't be running. You're going to lose all your electricity that powers it. They're all, all those power stations are going to be gone. And then you have to rebuild everything. So are people going to be riding the train to a big disaster? Uh, you know, think about the consequences of what a disaster is going to bring. It's going to cause massive rebuilding of infrastructure. Really, all your money should be now starting to spend on sea level rise mitigation and uh, moving everything, the wastewater treatment plant, away from the vulnerable sand island area. Um, so many things that should be done now. And that's what Dr. Chip Fletcher is saying. He said, come on, folks, get serious about this. It's coming. It's going to be big. It's going to be the biggest disaster anyone's ever seen. So why are we building all, spending all these billions on a big disaster when we should be spending on already preparing for what's coming? These are top scientists. They're not making it up. You know? So I, I think that should be your responsibility. In the meantime, if you did this Pearl Harbor crossing idea, that will work with whatever sea level, sea level rise happens for the next 50, 100 years. The Navy's going to have to deal with that, their own issues about that. But that's something that will just be ongoing because they're boats. They float. So as it goes up, the, the ferries will ride until eventually whatever happens, happens. But that's an inexpensive infrastructure that you won't lose in a disaster. So. Thank you. Uh, my recommendation would be uh, during the period that we were there, that old railway was just our only evacuation out of Damon Track. And also the military and the military defense workers, civilian defense workers, by the thousands that were living in those CHA homes, military uh, contractor homes down there for contracting work. The only escape out of there was on the old railway. And uh, I think we should address the infrastructure problem that he's brought up. I Thank think you. that's a great idea. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other questions, comments? Thank you, Mr. Bond. Okay, thank you very much, and aloha. Aloha. Anyone else here uh, wishing to testify on any of the agenda items? If not, thank you. We will be moving on to the next item. Uh, it is the approval of minutes of the meeting of the Board of Directors. Um, I am asking uh, the members that we defer August 8th and August 10th. So up for consideration and discussion is July 28, 2016 meeting. Uh, members, may I have a, um, a motion to approve motion. the minute? Second. second. And a second? Or open for discussion? Any discussion, members? If not, I'm going to call for the vote. So I, oh, Barbara? Good morning, Barbara Armentra. Um, I noticed um, we come to all of them. Rose Pole and Barbara Armentra are not listed as attendants on here, and I was here when John Henry Felix was sworn in. So on the July 28th meeting. John, yeah, the 28th. We will, we will note that correction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Any other comments? With that uh, amendment to the minutes, um, members, do we have unanimous consent? We do. Thank you very much. So July 28, 2016, minutes are adopted. And again, we are deferring August 8th and August 10th to the next meeting. We are now going to item number four, report of the heart meeting with the Federal Transit Administration, Michael Formby and Sam Carnaggio. Thank you, Chair. So I'll I'll lead the discussion and then Sam will join me. Uh, back on July 21st, 2016, we received a letter from Acting FTA Administrator Carolyn Flowers. And in that letter, she offered to consider extending the recovery plan due date to 2017 upon two conditions. And the first condition was that we meet with FTA in August of 2016 the second condition, which we will address later, is that we file an interim plan by end of September of this year. So the first meeting that happened on two days, the first day, August 29th of 2016, was a technical meeting, was attended by myself, Deputy Director Brennan Morioka, and Project Director Sam Carnaggio. And at that meeting, 
Uh, we, we didn't expect the full team to be there the first day. We expected them to be there the second day. But on the first day, they all showed up. And basically, it was Acting Administrator Carolyn Flowers, Region 9 Administrator Leslie Rogers, and their FTA team from headquarters in DC. And we discussed the process that the city would have to go through to deliver a recovery plan. And on that first day, it was pretty obvious that the FTA was in a position that the city was not. And that is that they were asking us to go through a rigorous de-scoping uh, deferral process, uh, one that would impact ridership. And, and we, for the most part, listened and took notes and came back that afternoon and had a debriefing with the individuals that were going to attend on August the 30th. So on August 30th when we went, it was Mayor Caldwell, Council Chair Ernie Martin, Transportation Chair Joey Monahan, Chair Hanabusa, Vice Chair Damian Kim, myself, Deputy Director Brennan Morioka, and Project Director Sam Carnaggio. And it was the same FTA team, if you recall at that time, led by Acting Administrator Carolyn Flowers. Leslie Rogers was in attendance. And on August the 30th was where we had an opportunity to indicate to the FTA in a very unified voice that the city had a commitment to the minimum operable segment and that we did not wish to descope the project, to defer stations, to disengage communities, to negatively impact ridership, and to do additional planning studies that are required if you do all of those things. And as a result of that meeting, the acting administrator, Flowers, indicated that she would reconsider whether or not they were going to extend the recovery plan due date. The second meeting that we had was on September 13th, and that was myself, Deputy Director Brenda Morioka, and Project Director Sam Carnaggio, and that was in Los Angeles. And the purpose of that meeting was for us to follow up the September, I'm sorry, the August meeting in San Francisco, and basically indicate to them that we did not just speak in August, we were doing. That we had come back and that we had taken steps to address some of the issues that they wanted us to address, which was cost containment, pacing expenditures, focusing on our financial plan, on our budget, our project cost estimate, and we've gone way beyond that. And so on September 13th, we updated them. We had a very productive meeting in Los Angeles. And since then, uh, the team back at Hart, Brennan, Sam, Joyce, Oliveira, we've all gotten together. and We've been working intently on, on trying to make sure that when the interim plan is filed, which will likely not be until Monday or Tuesday of next week, it's in draft form today, that we will comply with the FTA's wishes, but at the same time, make the city's position well known to the FTA. Sam, would you like to add to that in any way? Only the fact that um, in the meeting in uh, San Francisco, uh, the attorney from FTA headquarters emphasized that Middle Street was definitely out. The project couldn't stop there, but they uh, were not ready to endorse uh, the full MOS as we had proposed it. As a matter of fact, they were pushing for this descoping uh, plan, which you'll hear called Plan B. Um, uh, that was their position, and they were pretty strong on it in, um, on that Monday, the first day. On the second day, when our elected officials, officials came in, and I should credit them because they all came together, the mayor, the president of the city council, city council chair, um, uh, the chair, um, our chair and vice chair were already on board, and they completely changed the minds and had the um, acting administrator of the FTA really give it a lot of thought and see our position. Uh, they seem to be um, retreating a little bit from that position, but we're still pushing. And as Director uh, Formby said, uh, we have a pretty strong case to present. Uh, one other item, if I might add, um, Director, is that um, one of the commitments that we made to them was to have a peer review by the APTA committee. and. Uh, while we were in Los Angeles, we met with APTA, which is the American Public Transportation Association, um, uh, discussed it with them, and they are um, recommending a panel of people right now that we hope will come out by the end of October and do a peer review of our agency. They'll focus on contract administration, um, change orders, and some of our processes. 
So it was very successful. I think the uh, FTA sees that we're very serious about this and that we are totally committed to having the entire MOS constructed to go all the way to Alam One. And Chair, and to add to that, the, the peer review letter, which you should have received a copy of, and if you have not, we'll get the board copies. It's in the public realm. Is dated September the 8th, 2016. And in putting that peer review letter together, together we had to basically distill down to three or four bullets max subject matter areas that we would like the peer review industry experts to come and look at. And, and to Sam's credit, he worked with the PMOC and the FTA so that when we sent those in, we knew those were substantive areas that they had concerns, that we have concerns, and that we think the peer review results will help us run this project better. Though Damon is not here, as you all know under the Sunshine Law, because the two of us were there, we also have to come up with a report. So I really don't have very much uh, more to say than what's been said here, except that I was very surprised that uh, what the FTA brought uh, with them was their, their chief counsel from Washington, D.C. And that is, I think that was a, a strong statement to us as to how serious they were. I think the other issue that we as a, the Hart board as well as our staff should be aware of is the most disturbing part about it was that the FTA received their positions on how the community felt based on, with all due respect, people like Marcel's reports. That was the source of information. It was not a communication from the board or from basically the heart staff. It was how the media was portraying where we were. And that's why they were, they came fully loaded because they thought that the uniform position was that we would end at Middle Street. And that's what we all uniformly wanted. And it was, uh, it was a startling revelation. And for them, the reason why they were taken aback was because everyone that was there said, no, we, we, don't, we know we can't end at Middle Street. It was just a matter of basically where is the money and what can we do with the money if, if, if they don't give us any additional time to explore other sources of funding. They also raised, um, in addition to the peer review, and by the way, uh, APTA is an organization that has been very positive to Hawaii, as uh, Joe Magaldi sitting in the audience knows. The bus, as we affectionately call it, uh, won the APTA Best Bus in Americas twice under our good mutual friend, uh, James Cowan, who's fortunately no longer with us. But he was, uh, and he had won uh, the APTA system awards and best administrator awards on his own for Portland as well. So they, Hawaii has a lot of credibility with APTA. There was not only the prior review that they're referring to, cost containment was another. They wanted to see us do a cost containment and an updated financial plan, which we all, I think we all agree are things that we have to, we have to get out there. Uh, one of the things that I did find troubling is that Cost containment is something that the PMOC has been asking of us uh, anyway from the time I was on the board. So I went back and I have a folder of just all the uh, minutes and the PMOC reports on the day I stepped on the board and every single one has an issue of cost containment. So I think it signals to us a very clear message as to the fact that even if we may not like what they're saying, you can't ignore it because it's gonna come back to get us in the end and that's cost containment. So with that, um, I believe that both Damien, Kim and I felt that it was a very productive meeting because we went in there uh, after the report from Mike, Brennan and Sam on Monday afternoon as we all landed was that they are probably gonna tell us this, this, this project is gonna have a major problem in trying to effectively descope within their guidelines. And remember now, every time we tinker with any major station, we are affecting ridership. And ridership is one of their number one indicators as to the viability of this project. So, members, any questions? Not, I think we'll move on, that was our report. 
The next item on the uh, agenda is um, item number five, which is the draft letter uh, to the FDA regarding the September interim plan. And this is the letter that Mike uh, uh, referred to. So Mike. Thank you, Chair. And so also this is a, a team effort, and it's myself, Deputy Director Brendan Morioka, Project Director Sam Carnaggio, and Joyce Oliveira. And this is the second requirement in Administrator Flowers July, 6, July 21st, 2016 letter. And it was that we submit an interim plan by the end of this month. And so we basically have it in draft form at this time. We're not prepared to release it to the board because it's still in the deliberative process. It's very important to us that we get this interim plan right. And we've been communicating on, on if not a daily basis, a weekly basis with the FTA and the PMOC about what they expect to see in this report because we don't want to submit it and then find out that it's it's not something that meets their needs so we're working on it we're also working to make sure that that uh, it's it's sensitive to the local legislators both at the state and the city level we don't want to presume anything and put that in the report and make presumptions that will hurt us later so we've asked the FTA if they would consider giving us a little bit more time because the end of the month comes over the weekend and we need to continue to work on this. The plan is to have the final draft ready on Monday, the final ready on Tuesday, and it would be submitted to the FTA on Tuesday. But essentially, this plan, as Sam described it, addresses Acting Administrator Carolyn Flowers' position that we have three options. The first option is to find revenue sources to build your minimum operable seg segment, and that's called a financial recovery plan. That's plan A. And as indicated at the San Francisco letter with the FTA, it is the city's preferred position that we will find the revenue sources to build the minimum operable segment. Plan B is what we refer to as build to budget. And that is where Carolyn Flowers said, what can you do within the existing revenue stream that you have? And when you go down that path, you have to address all the impacts that shortening the MOS have to the program. So as Sam said, ridership impacts, deferring stations, and one of Sam's constant reminders to all of us is that if you defer a station, for example, if, if we go from Middle Street to somewhere between Middle Street and Ala Moana, but we do not reach Ala Moana, and we cut every station out along the way so that we can get the guideway as far as we can, what is the impact to the Kalihi community when they have no stations to access the rail line? So they stand on the street, they see the rail cars go by, but they can't get on the rail unless they drive backward on the system. So they go the opposite direction that they wish to go. So we have to address all of those issues in Plan B, which is built to budget. And Plan C, which we're not addressing in specifics because it really is a compromise, it's the middle ground. You get some money, but you don't get enough, so you still have to de-scope your program and build something less than the MOS. And so the interim plan, is a work in progress. I apologize that we cannot give you a final today. We're simply not there yet, but we will be by Monday or Tuesday of next week, at which time it will become a public document. So Sam, do you want to add to that? No, just to express my bias, that plan B, I think is a terrible plan to defer stations. And, and uh, uh, we're gonna give it an honest uh, approach and um, uh, present it as honestly as we can, but um, it's just terrible for our community. And. Um, and so we're going to work very hard on, on getting to Ala Moana. Members, any questions or comments? So just so that uh, we're clear and, and that the public is aware, when this letter becomes public to us, because we haven't seen it, the public will also have access to that letter as well. Yes, Chair, that's correct. And, and um, it really doesn't require board action because as you all know the way the charter is written um, this board unfortunately doesn't have very much authority but um, Sam I just want to be clear that on June 8th when Brenda Morioka presented all the quote options that though they may not necessarily be the final uh, analysis that impact of what we saw of the various options is really what you're referring to. You will cut yes. the ridership numbers and all of that. So the public can go back to that. I believe it is on the web and you can see how devastating just building to budget 
can be on this project. So members, any other questions or comments? Chair, can I add one yes. point? Just to make sure that there's not an expectation to see something that will not be there. The interim plan is not the recovery plan. That's it right. is the FTA telling us we want to see the process that you will go through to get to the recovery plan if we make you do that either by the end of the year or by mid-2017. So it's a process document. It describes the process that we're going to go through. It does not present discrete options, and it does not make a recommendation as to what we would do. That would be in the recovery plan. Chair, may I ask a question? Yes. So, um, Director. By the way, welcome. Uh, thank I'm you very sorry. much. No, no. <laughs> Members of the public, <laughs> Mark Garrity is the, uh, is the acting heart board member as the acting DTS administrator. So I'm you're the new I'm Michael. I'm an actor. Yes. You're, the, you're the new Michael Formby. Yes. So next to him is, is uh, Art Chalicombe, who is the deputy of the Department of Planning and per Permitting. And he is, of course, the acting for our good friend, uh, Mr. Atta. And he's also acting, but that's okay. All right, Mr. Garrity, sorry. I almost forgot my question now that you're <laughs> That was the purpose of my yes. <laughs> um, Director Formby, so when, uh, when do you expect to hear from the FDA regarding um, their decision about when you have to submit the actual recovery plan? Is it based on what you're going to say in the interim plan, or, or when, what, what are you thinking about that? Yeah, so we asked that question in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and, and the response that we got back was they will wait until they receive the interim plan, they review it and then they will make a collective decision as to whether we have to produce a recovery plan by end of this year or by some point in 2017. So I hope, with, I hope we'll hear in October. I mean, I don't want to wait until November or December because it's too late. So we'll be putting pressure on the FTA to give us a decision shortly after we submit the plan. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? If you recall, uh, members, that was our problem when we got the first letter was that we could not come up with a, disc a recovery plan by August. So we're looking at a recovery plan by the end of August at that time. And I will just remind everyone, if you, and everyone probably knows this, we have a presidential election going on. So the reason why there is this end of the year issue is because technically the administrators will more than likely all change over. So that's why they want to clear this up. But if they will con consent to giving us more time, because you know the, the civil servants continue, the ones who are actually doing this will continue. It's just the acting administrators and they. So that's one of the, the issues that we are dealing with and we're hoping that we're making enough of a case to them that um, the change in a president should not affect Hawaii. Let's see if we're successful in doing that. So members, any other questions or comments? Okay, we are now moving to item number six, which is the report and recommendation of the permitted interaction group, the PIG as we call it, to recruit, solicit interest from, screen and negotiate with candidates for interim executive director and chief executive officer and or executive director and chief executive officer. So, uh, Mr. Lee, unfortunately, <laughs> you, yep. we're planning to you again because uh, both the chair of the pig as well as the vice chair of the pig are, are not here. <laughs> so thank you, Terry. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, I'm happy to report that you know we we did receive um, some very uh, good qualified resumes applying for the interim executive director position. Um, most of us in the PIG have had the opportunity to speak to those candidates um, and we've, we've come up with someone that we want to make a recommendation to. However, because things are moving so quickly, um, this particular individual was not comfortable having his name released publicly yet because he hasn't had the opportunity to uh, talk to people that he needs to talk to uh, about his interest in the position. And so, um, for that reason, Madam Chair, we, we'd like to uh, discuss and identify that candidate and make our recommendation in executive session, um, and then try to move quickly to, uh, uh, you know, make his name public. Thank you very much. So, is there a motion 
And uh, please be sure we follow the, uh, our Corporation Council's uh, requirements and what is contained in the motion. So somebody making a motion to that effect? Or maybe I should just say <laughs> this. Then, since, since. So the, the, the motion is that the board may enter into executive session pursuant to Hawaii Revised Statute Section 92-4 subsection 92-5A2 to consider the higher evaluation, dismissal, or discipline of an officer or an employee or of charges brought against the officer or employee where consideration of matters affecting privacy are involved. By the way, that's a direct quote of the statute. That's why it has all those other things in it. And subsection 92-5A4, and that is to consult with its attorneys on questions and issues pertaining to the board's powers, duties, privileges, immunities, and liabilities. So will somebody confirm that as a So motion? moved. Mr. Garrity, a second? Second. Second. So with that, members, we will go into executive session. Thank you. Members, we're back in session. We are on uh, item number six on the agenda, which is the recommendation of the permitted interaction group. We are returning from executive session. However, before we um, take any motions from the board itself, are there any members of the public who wish to speak to item number seven? If not, Mr. Lee. Yeah. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion. Uh, the motion is to accept the recommendation of the PIG and authorize the acting executive director in consultation with the PIG to negotiate with and report back to the board on the hiring of the interim executive director. Is there a second? Second. Is there a second? Members, discussion. Any discussion? I do wish to inform the public that the uh, reason why the name is not revealed is because it is a personnel matter and we have had an affirmative request that the name not be revealed until the negotiation process is final. So any other discussion members? If not, um, I assume we have unanimous consent on this members? Yes. We are all in agreement. Thank you very much. So. The motion is carried. On item number seven, which is the procurement process for permanent heart executive director and CEO, we are going to defer that matter because we don't have an interim to participate in that process. So we will just defer. Members, any objections to that deferral? <coughs> Not, thank you. Now we are going to item number eight, which is the presentation on West Oahu Farrington Highway and Kamehameha Highway Guideway Attendant issue. I would like to um, first have the um, acting executive director Michael Formby to address this and then he can call up the member of his staff who can best brief the board on this. Mr. Thank Formby. you chair. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to make this presentation and the following presentation number nine on the agenda today. As you may know from reading the PMOC reports, these are technical issues that have been reported for some time. And because there are potential legal and policy implications, we believe it's appropriate to bring a factual historical presentation to you at this time. So we will report what we know. We will not get into legal or policy type questions at this point, but we will present the facts as we know them and we'll let you know where we are in the investigative process. So first on the Tinden issue, we have tacos. And you can bring up Chris Takashige, anybody that wants to join him from the technical team. My name is Taka Kimura. I am the GEC design manager for Heart. And I will be speaking 
I'll be speaking to you today about the uh, issue of, uh, that we're experiencing with attendance. So before I get started, um, I want to have some definitions because it is a pretty technical matter, so I want to let everyone know uh, what I'm speaking about. Um, the tendons are uh, the tendons are steel um, cables that uh, run through each span. This is a typical span that you see. Um, the top view is looking at the diaphragm down the axis of the of the guideway. So um, you'll see there. Oh, thank you. So these. Um, circular areas here, those are the anchors. Those are where the tendons are anchored into the diaphragms at, at either end of the span. This on the, on the bottom is a typical span. And you'll see that the anchors are, uh, the tendons are anchored in the diaphragms at the end. They deviate down to these deviation blocks, run along the bottom of the box, and run up um, at the other end of the span. And if you look into, at this uh, photograph here, you'll see that the tendons, when they go through the span, are outside of the, 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 the concrete uh, in plastic ducts. Looking a little closer at the tendons themselves, I want to tell you some terminology so that uh, we know what we're talking about. This is, this is a typical tendon. Um, and, and the typical span has approximately six tendons per span. Each tendon is made of uh, individual strands, um, usually about 27 of these strands. And each strand consists of seven individual wires that are braided together. So these, uh, these tendons, once the, once the span is put in place, these uh, tendons are, are, are pushed through the ducts, are anchored on either side uh, with this anchor wedge. Um, they're pulled to a specified tension, and then uh, this area inside the ducts is filled with a grout. It's a cementitious material that sets up almost like concrete, and uh, the purpose of that grout is to protect the tendons. Um, the grout fills the tube. It also um, There's also a, a plastic cap that goes over the anchors, and the grout also fills that cap to, to protect the, uh, the anchors. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, the, the tendons have to be protected from the elements against uh, corrosion. So after the tendons are installed, um, the tendons are grouted within uh, 14 days. What happens is uh, there are um, pumps that are connected to these grout ports. You open up the grout ports, you uh, pump the, the grout in under pressure, and then the grout will fill the ducts uh, until the grout comes out of, of uh, spouts at the anchorages. And once that happens, then they lock off uh, those spouts, um, and then they allow the, uh, the, the grout to cure. And if it is not grouted within 14 days, uh, our specifications say that you must uh, insert a corrosion inhibiting powder to protect the, uh, the tendons until the grout can be installed. So a, a little summary of, of, of this issue. Um, and there are actually two related things that I'd like to talk about. First um, uh, has to do with fractured strands. Uh, we've experienced uh, three of the tendons, uh, three of the 1,586 tendons on the wolf segment um, have experienced fractured, span, uh, fractured, fractured uh, strands. Um, and so what we need to do um, to address this issue uh, would be to take a look at what was causing uh, the issue and trying to prevent any future fractures. Um, obviously replace any of the defective tendons uh, that we know of. And then uh, somehow ensure the integrity of the remaining installed tendons. Uh, the second issue that um, I want to bring up today would be uh, grout. Now, the grout is very important because it protects the tendons uh, from corrosion. Um, and uh, through uh, Kiewit's grout records, we see that there were areas where there were either uh, voids, which would be sort of uh, bubbles uh, in, the in the grout, 
um, and areas with soft grout. Now, um, if the mix of the, uh, the grout material and, say, the water is um, not correct, then the grout would have a hard time setting up, and then it might not be as uh, firm as it needs to be. Um, so what we need to do is, is uh, fill the voids that, that we know of, replace the tendons with soft grout, because there's no way to fix the grout once you know that it's soft. You just have to remove the tendon in its entirety and reinstall a, a brand new tendon. Um, and then what we also need to do is ensure uh, the grout integrity of the remaining tendons. So we have a flow chart of, of uh, various steps um, in a root cause analysis. I uh, just wanted to put this up to show you that this is uh, the stage that we're at right now um, to identify and implement a corrective action. Uh, we've gone through the process of identifying the problem, collecting data, analyzing that data, and identifying probable causes. And so this is the stage that we're at uh, with respect to the, uh, the tendon issue. So to give you a little timeline of, of what occurred, um, we were first made aware of this issue on uh, January 25th of this year. Uh, that's when we experienced the first uh, fracture. Uh, one tendon on span 258 uh, experienced uh, fractured strands. And the way we discovered this, uh, you'll see in this picture to the side, um, this tendon is under a lot of, of tension. So when it, when it when a strand snaps, it's like a rubber band just being, being cut. And so um, what happened is the strands blew out through the uh, plastic caps. And so that's how we were made aware of, of the issue. Um, obviously, this is, a, this is a problem. And so what Kiwa did on, on, um, on their own is they went in, they cut out the, the tendon, and they uh, completely replaced uh, the tendon in its entirety. And then uh, in, in uh, April of this year, Span uh, 249 experienced two tendons with fractured strands. And it was very similar. Um, and you can see this drawing as well, or this photograph below. Um, strands protruded out from the uh, anchor caps. And that's how we were made aware of that. Um, and in, also in this case, both of those tendons were cut out uh, and completely replaced. So obviously, this is a, a, a fairly technical issue. So um, Hewitt hired a uh, forensic engineering consultant uh, called Exponent to uh, help them determine uh, the probable cause and determine what uh, steps should be taken to uh, remedy the, the issue. Uh, and we, uh, on, on the heart side, uh, also hired a, a forensic consultant named Wish Janie Elsner uh, to help us evaluate and just make sure that what um, their forensic engineering consultant uh, was saying is, is accurate. So the probable cause, uh, we had taken a look and what, uh, what Kiwit had determined was that, um, that water entering the anchors is the probable cause. Uh, there are several locations where deck drains um, are directly above the anchor heads. And um, these, in the final configuration, there will be a downspout that connects it to the, uh, to the, uh, the pipe that's in the, the column that will take the water down to the, to the ground. But uh, those have not been installed yet. So we just have these open uh, inlets that, that allow water to just freely uh, drain through here. Um, what they feel happened is the water that came down, some of it got onto the anchors and entered the, uh, the tendons through the anchorages and caused the corrosion that we experienced. Um, what they have said is that water in the ducts, um, if there is a corrosion inhibitor in there, uh, water, standing water in the duct will render that uh, powder ineffective. And we confirmed that. We, we knew who the manufacturer of that powder was, so we gave them a call. And they verified that, yes, indeed, um, if there is standing water, um, that powder would not be effective. So, um, and uh, what led them to believe this um, is the probable cause is that uh, the corrosion and the fractures that occurred were all limited uh, to the anchor areas. Um, the fractures happened 
on the other side of the anchors, anchors within maybe about a foot or two, and all the corrosion was centered on the anchor heads. So when they, every time that they replaced the tendon, they would have to cut the uh, tendon in the middle, pull the, the steel out, and they noticed that as you got to the, uh, the mid-span, then the, the tendons were pristine. So we felt that that was a pretty good indication that all the, all the uh, corrosion was occurring at the anchor heads. So the corrosion itself, um, since the corrosion was occurring at the anchors, uh, it led us to believe that the corrosion would cause the fractures and cause the issues that we've been experiencing. So when we started speaking with Kiwit, uh, one of the things that we wanted to make sure is that this wouldn't occur um, on the future tendons that need to be crowded. So they did a, a few things. Um, one thing was to divert uh, the drain inlet water away from the anchors um, until that permanent downspot could be installed. So basically what they did is they put uh, these plastic sleeves onto the, uh, the bottoms of the inlets and that would uh, harmlessly direct the water away from, from the anchors to the ground below. Um, and then the second thing that they uh, instituted was uh, a little more stringent inspection. So what they do now, before they grout the, the tendons, they would take the plastic cap off and visually inspect every anchor. Um, if, there, if there's corrosion on the anchor, then they would replace it. Uh, if the tendon anchor was pristine, then it was an indication that the whole tendon was probably pristine as well. And, they, uh, and since they've in, in instituted this uh, practice, they did find one tendon with a corroded anchor, and they did uh, replace that in its entirety. Uh, and then the second thing that they would do is uh, to check for uh, water at the low point. So as you saw in that first graphic, um, the tendon ducts deviate down and run along the bottom of the box uh, to the mid-span. So there's a, a rubber connector where the, uh, the uh, inclined duct meets the, the, the bottom uh, duct. And so what they, they've started doing is they've uh, opened up that duct, uh, that rubber boot is what it's called, and they'll check for water at the low point uh, to make sure that there isn't any water, standing water in the ducts. And so the, the third thing that I mentioned that, that we have to do is we have to ensure the, uh, the integrity of the uh, tendons that have already been, been grouted. Uh, unfortunately, once it's grouted, it's very difficult to examine because the grout is, is very hard and it's encased in that. So what uh, Kiwit took it upon themselves to start looking at um, the anchors. So taking off the anchor caps, chipping the grout away physically and exposing the anchor heads and the tails again, looking at the anchors just to see if there was any corrosion. Uh, the belief being if you found it in pristine condition, then you didn't have to worry about that tendon. If you found corrosion, then there's a good chance that there's a problem. So they did this in three stages. The first stage, they exposed 26 tendons um, that they knew had uh, water in the ducts or exceeded 180 days between installation and grouting. Um, they keep pretty uh, detailed records, and so they were able to identify um, these tendons that they felt might be a high probability of having a problem. Um, and of those 26, two were found uh, to have corroded anchors. And so Kiwit, uh, for those, in those instances, Kiwit went in, they cut out the tendons and uh, completely replaced them and uh, grouted them. In stage two, um, they went back and looked at their grouting records and looked for tendons that had um, documented problems with grout, um, either uh, water that may have come out of the spout prior to the, um, the grout coming out, or um, they do uh, what's called a mud balance test. So when the grout comes out of the, um, the anchors, the anchor ends, they'll take a sample and then they'll basically measure its density. So you'll know that if it doesn't have the proper density, there's a good chance that there was water in the tendon and that's what's throwing off uh, the density of the grout. So uh, they looked back and there were six instances of that. So they went back and they exposed those anchors. And what they discovered is there was one uh, corroded anchor discovered out of those six. And uh, again, they went back, cut that out, and replaced that tendon in its entirety. 
And then the third stage, uh, they wanted to give us a level of comfort for all of the other tendons that uh, didn't have any either of those um, indications of a, a possible problem. So they uh, employed a, a statistician to do uh, to come up with a statistical analysis of what would be a good sampling to to investigate. So um, what they came up with was a random sampling of 25 tendons. Um, Hart uh, Kiewit went back and they exposed those uh, 26 uh, tendons, the anchors of those ten tendons, and um, they found that there were no uh, areas with, with, with corrosion. Um, so we are currently in the process of reviewing that. Um, there were some, there are, we do have some questions about their sample size. Uh, we have um, submitted those and we will return those questions back to Kiewit and we'll, we'll discuss uh, what a proper uh, sample size might be. So the, the second issue that I wanted to talk about was, was the grout. And the grout, obviously, um, is very related to the tendons because that's the, the main thing that, that protects the tendons against uh, corrosion. And again, um, so this is a, uh, a graphic showing uh, where we are in the root cause analysis. And uh, we are in uh, the same location um, with this issue as well. We've uh, got, gotten to the point where we've, we've identified probable causes, and now we're um, trying to implement some kind of corrective action for this. So Kiwit went back and looked at their grouting records, um, and it showed that uh, there were 18 tendons that had grout voids. Um, those were all repaired per the spec by doing what's called vacuum grouting. So basically, it's going back in and filling up those voids uh, with uh, viable grout. Um, and then there were six tendons that they knew of that had soft grout. Uh, so they went back and replaced those um, in, its, in their entirety. Um, again, because there isn't anything you can do. There's no way to fix soft grout other than just replacing and repairing. Um, and then, in addition to those instances where, that they knew of, what they've done is uh, they've taken uh, an inspection program where um, they'll have a person, and you see it in this picture. It's kind of hard to see, but he's got, what he has is he has a hammer in his hand. And he's walking down the length of the tendon, and he's hitting the tendon as he walks down the length. Uh, and what that does, if, it's, if the tendon is, um, is of good quality, then there'll be a, a pretty solid sound. If you hear kind of a thud sound, then you'll know that there's, there's a problem. So uh, that's what the person in the uh, photo is doing. So they've uh, taken it upon themselves to uh, inspect 100% of the tendons. So they walked every single tendon that had been installed and grouted, and they, uh, they, um, they did what's called sounding with a hammer. And they did that. Uh, I think they, they, yeah, they've completed that already, and um, they've determined that that the grout is uh, in good shape for all the other um, tendons that were not in those reports. And, um, and one thing to note, proper grouting not only will protect uh, what's out there, but speaking to our forensic engineer and um, Kiewit's forensic engineer, um, that grout should effectively halt any kind of corrosion process that we may have missed. Um, what it does Corrosion is a, is a chemical reaction, uh, and one of the required elements would be oxygen. So what the grout does, by covering it, co by covering the, uh, the tendon completely, it effectively cuts off any oxygen and would stop any kind of corrosion process that may have been in process. So the current status, um, Kiewit, so Kiewit has replaced all the known problem tendons um, Three of the tendons were due to the fractures uh, that I mentioned previously. Uh, three of the tendons that were replaced were due to corroded anchors. And six tendons were replaced due to soft grout. Um, I wrote down here that we received a preliminary report uh, from Kiewit um, on the 2nd of September. Uh, I was just told this morning that we received the final report um, yesterday. So I have not seen it yet but uh, we will review it and um, we'll provide any comments that we have uh, back to Kiewit. Um, 
we, we did receive the re report from uh, Kiewit statistician. We did have some comments and questions, so we've provided them to, uh, or we we're in the process of providing them to, to Kiewit, and uh, we plan to have some uh, meetings to discuss the findings and to get to a good level of comfort that what was done um, would be satisfactory uh, to us. Uh, and we are per holding periodic sta um, status meetings with Kiwit to, to go over this. So it's an ongoing process. They know that it's a, it's a, a big issue. And we feel, certainly feel that the same. So we've been having uh, period periodic meetings to uh, discuss this issue with them and to keep up to date with the, the status of the investigation. So the next steps would be to um, receive, review, and reach some concurrence on that final report, um, which Jenny Elsner will also write up a summary uh, report of their findings. And I expect that uh, once we come to some sort of um, concurrence, uh, we'll probably present our res results to the, the board at that point. So I thank you for your time. Um, if there are any questions, I'd love to hear them. Members, Mr. Fong. Yeah, just three questions. Uh, can those anchors be made of non composed corrosive materials? And secondly, were those strand fractures under load, tested under load when they fractured? Or okay. the fluid will it uh, necessitate periodic inspections going forward in the operation? Good questions. Um, so, the first you were asking whether or not um, it could, the Anchors could be made out of some non corrosive material. Um, that is not the industry standard. Um, it, it's very high stresses, and um, I don't think that there's any manufacturer out there that makes anchors out of non corrosive material. And even if the anchors themselves are made out of non corrosive material, the tendons themselves, uh, they're very high strength steel. So um, as of yet, there's, there's no manufacturer that makes a non-corrosive uh, uh, tendon. So unfortunately, that, that uh, can't be done. Um, I'm sorry, uh, your second question? second question was the fractured strands. Was it under a load that they fractured? No, well, um, other than the tension that it experienced itself. I mean, it was holding up the span. So um, there's a certain um, tension that each strand, each uh, tendon is under. So, but, but no load. There was no. Uh, there was a dead load, but there were no trains running over it. Yes, that's correct. And going forward, to, is it going to necessitate uh, annual inspections or periodic ins inspections on the anchors? So, um, basically, every bridge in the United States has to be inspected um, every other year, and that uh, is a what's called an arm's length um, inspection. So. Every other year, uh, somebody has to go through and look at the exterior of the box, the interior of the box, um, look for cracks. If there are cracks, they have to be noted and recorded. Uh, and every year, those cracks will be monitored. So um, yes, uh, every bridge needs to be, and, and, and this uh, bridge is no exception. Thank you. Sure. Members, any other questions? Anyone else? I have um, some questions, Taco. Sure. This is my um, tendons and uh, every tendon, I mean, every uh, PMOC report that I, when I was on the board, I noticed that the first mention of the tendon issue was in what would be the June um, PMOC report, which mm -hmm. means we got it in July. Mm -hmm. So, though you're saying it came to be known in January, mm -hmm. it wasn't reported to the PMO until some later date, or it was, well, definitely wasn't included in the report, and it wasn't reported to the board. Mm -hmm. So, do you know when the first report went to the PMO? That I'm not aware of, Chris, do you know? It was July, June or July, because that's when it's, it's included in here. So according to this, I just want to be sure because it's sort of mentioned in the same time about the problem with a wolf span 17. That has nothing to do with the tendons, right? Wolf this span is not, right. Okay. So, so we have these, these tendons, and I was doing a little bit of a calculation. So out of the 26 and two 
uh, were taken out on a, a controlled, uh, basically on the anchors. It's about 8%. Then when you have six, and this was the soft grout, and you changed one, that's about 16%. And then now, and I assume that every single grouted anchor was looked at, right? No. Um, and, and that's that's the... I mean, that's for the, soft grout, it wasn't looked at? Oh, for soft grout, um, we didn't even look at the anchors. We knew that there were soft grout already, and so those were those were replaced. So there could be something out of this, because we're talking about 1,586 tendons, Correct. right? Yes. So I'm trying to figure out, out of the 1,586, how many have actually been physically inspected? <laughs> for the... For the grout issues, 100% were the, the, the person. But that's the tapping, right? right? That's the tapping. But how right. about whether it Exposing looks Exposing the like, anchors. Yeah, whether the anchors are looks funny or the grout looks funny. Right. I mean, I assume it could be solid, but somehow on the end it could be soft grout or something. Right. So out of the 1,586, how many have been looked at? So the... Um, so that was the uh, that three-staged... Right. Inspection. So, so 26. 26, 6. And 25 tendons. Right. And 25. So that's all. That's all that were, were inspected. Um, and that, um, the first two made, made sense because those are the, are the right. high probability ones. Um, the third stage, and, and that's what we have some comments on, and we responded to that because we're, we're not... 100% sure that that's adequate as well. So we. So, so just so we're work. clear, it's not 25% of the remainder. It's just 25 that right. were randomly selected, right? Correct. So the total of my, I should ask Terry Fujii, she's better than me. <laughs> I have 57. Correct. 57 out of 1,586. Anchors that were looked at, yes. Were looked at. Yes. And Kiwit's position is this is sufficient, that we should be assured that after looking at 57 anchors, that uh, it's fine? That is their position, yes. And but Hart's position, or your, your recommendation to uh, the executive director or whoever, mm -hmm. is that you have not arrived at a conclusion yet. I assume that the 25 is sufficient. Am I correct on that? Yes. Uh, we provided some comments to that uh, statistician's report. Um, there were some things that we... Uh, some assumptions that were made that we weren't too sure what the basis was. Uh, we did the same type of math and uh, we're questioning the validity of, of, of their, their plan. Um, we have not had a chance to sit down and talk with Kiwit about this yet. Um, so at this point, you know, we just have a lot of questions that still need to be answered. Because, you know, when we do a statistical analysis of a sampling within a universe, there is an assumption that that universe is somehow homogeneous or there's something about it that we can assume. Right. So we have 1,586 minus 57, so 1,500 whatever that comes out to be, 40 mm -hmm. whatever, 30 whatever. That, that, that remaining number is a homogeneous group so that we can randomly sample 25 and that should give us some level of comfort. That's basically Kiwit's position, right? Correct. But these are, these are made by human beings, basically, correct? Yes. Each one is stressed under each condition. Right. So how do we know or why are we supposed to be assured that 25 is sufficient? That's a very good question that we'd like to sit down and okay. talk with them about. So I assume that the staff Mm -hmm. And through the executive director, will not simply agree that we'll take this without coming back to the board, um, even if you may not have to do it, to come back to the board and see whether or not we are going to accept that. Because I don't see how we can just simply accept 57 out of 1,586. Is that, is that understood? Sure, okay. yes. And do you personally feel comfortable with 1,000 out of 1,586 to 57 is a sufficient sample? For Speaking personally, just my right. opinion. Right. That's why we pay you the big bucks. <laughs> As I wish I got paid us. big bucks. <laughs> As a, well, you pay more than us. <laughs> zero of zero is still zero. <laughs> Point taken. Um, yes, I have serious questions about 
the validity of, of the assumptions that were made. Do you have any idea as to how much the removal of one tendon costs? Because uh, that's what they're doing, right? If they don't like it, they remove it. Correct. Right? Do you know how much that costs? Not off the top of my head. I'm Can you get sure. that information? Sure. And I assume that because we don't have anything running on the top, <laughs> we can remove it now. But when the train starts running, what is the cost to the people of removing a tendon? In other words, what's the downtime? How long is it going to take? You know, what's the, of course, we have the consideration of public confidence in the system. But do you have any idea of what that would mean? We'd have to shut down, I assume, the system. You can't remove a tendon and then just simply have let the train keep going and replace it. Correct. It'd be, it'd be much more difficult once the, uh, the system is up and running. Do you know how long it takes to replace a tendon? Um, I don't know exact, the exact amount of time. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not months or anything like that, but uh, I don't know exactly how much time. So just so that I'm clear, you know, we're, we're, these tendons are used to stress each span and only the span, correct? So it's not used to tie the whole system together. Correct. It's, uh, each it's span, span is a unit in and of itself. So one span will not affect... The next span. Correct. Okay. So uh, members, any other questions? Yes. So, one other. so let's say an, a tendon fails mm -hmm. and we're not aware of it. Mm -hmm. What is the safety risk of that? So, um, what they, uh, one thing that I didn't mention in my presentation um, was uh, that Kiwit um, did a, a little test like that. They, they had a, a, a diaphragm segment that had some sort of defect, and so they were going to discard it anyway. So what they did is they kind of ca cast uh, a length of the segment that uh, would be the equivalent from the diaphragm to the deviation. Uh, and, and they, so they put a 27 strand tendon there, they stressed it, they uh, cut the ends off and they capped it and they grouted it. Uh, they let it sit until the grout set up. And then what they did is they exposed the anchors and they proceeded to burn out those anchor wedges one by one. So um, just to see what would happen. Um, their feeling was that uh, what would happen was if a and what they were trying to show us is in the event of the worst case scenario where a strand were to rupture after grouting, um, that force would be transferred through the grout back to the diaphragm. So they did, um, they initially did seven. I think the, the worst case that they experienced so far was five strands um, rupture, rupturing. So they, they said, okay, let's try seven and see what happens. So they burned out seven. Um, and waited for a day and came back and, and looked. And uh, there was no discernible distress, no signs of cracking. Uh, the tendon didn't snap in, things didn't fall apart. Um, so essentially what the grout does is it kind of encapsulates those uh, strands and will transfer that load back to the diaphragm. Uh, and what they did the second day just to see, I mean, since we were all, all out there, they said, we're going to just burn them all out and see what happens. So they did. So they, they, they burned up the remaining um, strands so that all 27 were no longer supported with the anchors. And uh, while there was cracking that was exhibited, um, the tendon didn't, didn't go anywhere. It didn't snap or anything like that. So um, what they're trying to show is that um, there wouldn't be a, a catastrophic failure. What would happen was, would be you might see signs of cracking in the diaphragm. Um, you might experience maybe more deflection than normal. Um, so what they were trying to tell us is that uh, you wouldn't get a failure of a whole span. You would see some distress, and you would know that you would have to essentially close down that, that span and replace it but it wouldn't be as if um, a whole span would, would all of a sudden give out without any warning. But, but they didn't put any load on that when they were doing that test, right? I mean, if there's a rail car on it, 
I mean, that's going to put more vertical force on it. So correct. So um, okay, I'm going to get kind of nerdy on you guys, but <laughs> <laughs> so the essentially the the um, the ends where where um, they're simulating um, don't really rely as much on the post tensioning as the, the middle portion. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's tension compression, there's bending, and there's shear. At closer to the, uh, to the piers, shear is the main uh, load that you're, you're carrying. And that's carried by the rebar that's in the, in the webs. Um, so what they wanted to show is that even though um, some of these uh, strands were sucked in after burning off the wedges, uh, the middle would stay viable, and that's where um, it carries most of the live load. Um, if you want, I could draw a diagram for you, but I don't think you really want to do that. But okay. what about, and this is always in, a, in anything that's up, that's like a bridge, it's the oscillating factor. So in other words, when you have like a train that's constantly moving over the surface, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, like when the Hyatt Regency, that little bridge that they had and people were bebopping to the music and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden it just, that's pre-stressed, is it gives way mm -hmm. because it's, it's not a custom, I mean, you know, the stress is a different kind of stress. And this is a constant stress because as the train goes over and over and over, did they test for that? Um, well, again, th that it's designed for that at, at mid-span. And so if the tendon is still viable <coughs> at mid-span, it should be okay. Um, So you're, you're correct. I mean, there, and that's called something called fatigue, where it's not just a constant load, but it's that, you know, that's how you can, that's how you can break a, a wire hanger. Mm -hmm. You know, you just bend it once, right. it's not okay. But then you, you keep on doing that over and over again, eventually it's going to give out. Um, and as long as the, the tendon is viable at mid-span, then it, it, um, it should be okay. Yeah, and, and, and that's, that's one of the things that they were trying to point out is that since the corrosion and the uh, fracture was occurring at the ends, that's where you'd expect that fracture to occur. But that's with 57 out of 1,586, yes. right? Correct. So how do we know that somewhere in the 1,586 5, 1, minus the 57 mm -hmm. that there isn't a potential problem? How do we know that? I mean, we know that they've tapped every single one with a hammer, right. but how do we know about the remaining ones that haven't been looked at? And that's, that's what we have a, a question about. Any other questions? So remember, you don't agree to anything. <laughs> <laughs> And we are not accepting 57 out of 1,580. Anyway, I do not believe this board is willing to accept that mm -hmm. as, as an, a sufficient amount of testing for something like the guideways. Mm -hmm. So, Chair, can I just add yeah. that, that because the final report was just received yesterday, we obviously are not prepared to speak to that, and so we have no consensus at this time. But we do have a third party forensic engineer we'll be consulting with and because you've made the request when we feel like we're in a position okay. to come up with a proposed resolution we'll come back to the board before it's executed thank you and and also i would like to know um and this is something that please uh speak to core or speak to uh, um, our own procurement people let's look at the bond because i it's not only what they say it's how we're going to protect this project into the future. So let's look at the bond, or let's look at whether they have to give us something else uh, in addition to that. Will do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Taka. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. So the next item is item number nine, and that is, well, members, is there any feeling that we need to go into executive session on this? Is there anything? I don't know. I don't think so. Since we're going to get a report back, I don't think we need to do that. Item number nine is the presentation of West Oahu Farrington Highway and Kamehameha Highway Guideway Trackward Shims. Kainani. By the way, Chris, I went back to my, my trusty folder, and in April, you and I had a discussion on shims. <clears throat> mm -hmm. It was in the March report. 
So, actually, it was called plinths. We're talking about plinths. Aloha board, aloha chair. I'm here to discuss the track work shims and the issues we've been, or Kiwit's been experiencing. So before we get started on the issues, I want to explain some of the um, definitions. A plinth is typically provided on guideways and bridges to adjust for a final rail tolerance, since guideways and bridges don't necessarily have those stringent tolerances. So when we think about this, it's the top of the rail. So that top of rail profile is designed, and that's where we want to hit when we finish the project. Shims are provided for the final vertical adjustment to meet those rail tolerance. These are made of high-density polyethylene, or HDPE. And we also have is isolation pads on this project. These provide electrical insulation between the rail and the guideways as part of stray current protection. These are also made of the high density polyethylene. So I brought some samples. This is um, the isolation pad, so I'm gonna pass this around. It's a 3 16 inch. And then as we go through the discussion, um, we can pass some of the others around. But this is a shim, so it's thicker. Same material, thicker. And um, this is another one, 1 8 inch sh uh, shim. So that's kind of some of the basics. Again, when we were talking about top of rail, that's the top of the black portion or the rail. Um, on a plinth system, you would have the concrete. So that's this gray portion. Um, the isolation pad is that blue one that is being passed around. So um, the plinthless system has this right on the top of the deck. So again, we have a shim in this system. Um, they come in various thicknesses, black and blue on this project. So that's just some of the basics of the discussion that we're gonna talk about today. There was a plinthless proposal made by Kiwit. Again, this is a design build contract. So to eliminate the concrete plinths during the proposal phase of the project, Kiwit came in, again, under design build, requesting that we, or at the time, city and county of Honolulu would entertain this proposal. Through that process, they estimated a $4.8 million cost savings for Wolf and 2.75 million cost savings for KHG. City and County of Honolulu accepted the proposal for Wolf on June 19 of 2009 and for KHG on June 4th, 2010. And the conditions of that were um, that drainage should be maintained and that the specifications in the contract would still have a 9 16th maximum shim height. Again, some background on the projects. Shims were provided by KKJV. Their isolation pads, so the 3 16 inch um, HDPE that, you, that was passed around, came from the MSF contract. That contract included rail procurement for the entire alignment. Kiwit, on the Wolf and KHG um, contracts, provided shims, again, of varying thicknesses. <coughs> Kiwit's original specification for Wolf and KHGs had the tolerances of a maximum height for the shims of 9 16 And again, we have the 3 16 isolation pad, both the shims and the isolation pads made of the same material. So again, that's a little bit of the background between the various contracts and the materials that we're discussing. There's two issues that Kiwit has faced on the design build project. Kiwit was unable to meet the vertical profile for the guideway construction, again, that top of rail elevation. Adjustments were required to meet the track work tolerances for the top of rail. Kiwit proposed to Hart that the shims for up to two inches um, would, would adjust the height, plus the 3 16 inch isolation pad. That, was, um, that proposal was given to Hart in July of 2015. And then there was still um, a couple or some locations where the height exceeded two inches. Kiwit proposed a mini plinth design for over two inch adjustment, and that proposal came to heart in March of 2016. 
Hart held a national peer review of industry experts, which was conducted in December of 2015. And Hart has acknowledged Kiewit's proposed technical corrective action. Cost and warranty issues are still being evaluated. So this, again, this is the vertical profile issue having to do with the shims. Again, going back to Taka's reference on the root cause analysis, for this particular issue, we've identified a technical solution. We've discussed with industry and um, peer technical experts on the viability of the uh, Kiewit's proposal, and they are currently implementing these corrective actions. Again, the next step would be a contract modification, if applicable, which is still currently under evaluation. So the, the other issues are the shim material itself. Um, again, I'm going to pass around some examples. With this, you'll see there's a little hairline crack. So early this summer, cracks were observed in the HDPE shims provided by Kiwit and the HDPE isolation pads provided by KKJV. So again, we went through the various contracts. Um, <coughs> you see here on that shim, and then here's another example. So the material that showed cracking were blue shims and blue isolation pads. Approximately 2,104 out of the 110,000 shims show evidence of cracking. Black shims currently show no evidence of cracking. So again, you saw the one black shim that was passed around. Again, where we're at with this root cause analysis is really identifying the possible causes. We just noticed during um, inspection that the um, problem existed and we're currently testing and understanding what the root cause is. To give you some timelines, again, the crack shims and isolation pads were observed in June of 2016, a couple months ago. Kiwit wrote a letter acknowledging the cracks July 21st, 2016. Hart notified KKJV of cracked isolation pads, or again, the shims, provided by KKJV through the MSF contract on July 21st, 2016. So again, we have KHG and Wolf, and we have KKJV through MSF. Non-compliance reports were issued on July of 2016 and September of 2016 to the various contractors. KKJV has come back and acknowledged the isolation pads may not conform with the specifications in their contract, again, under a design-build contract. That acknowledgement came in September 2nd, 2016. The content requirement for UV protection may not have been met. KKJV will provide, they've, they've committed to providing replacements for all the 165,000 isolation pads at no cost to heart. Again, that's through the MSF contract, that design build contract. Hart has requested from Kiwit verification that the, the shims used on their contracts comply with their specifications for Wolf and KHG. Currently, our next steps are to finalize the determination of the root cause for the shim material. Hart and Kiwit have sent the blue and black shims to independent testing labs. The results are expected soon, any day, still don't have them. KKJV through MSF has also, um, before shipment of the replacement shims they've committed to, will perform their independent verification testing. Those results also are expected any time now. And we are still awaiting Kiwit's response to the um, non-compliance that has been issued to them. For the height adjustment issue that we're dealing with on um, the plinthless system, we are still internally coming and evaluating a cost and warranty resolution um, for both the height adjustment as well as, as we get the root cause for the material issue, what the ramifications of that issue will be. That's all I have. Are there any questions? Members, any questions? On plinths. I have a question. Yeah. So these shims and isolation pads are already in place. Yes. So they have to go in and take them out and put the new ones in. Correct. Okay. Darren? Um, 
so looking at the cracks, I noticed, you know, the few of them were sort of, I mean, when they say minor, I'm a cracks crack, but one in particular was pretty significant. And so I'm just curious, I mean, is it just de degradation of the material because of the UV or is it, was there, was there weight on these things and that, and, and it's the pressure of the weight that's cracking them? So again, we've asked Kiwit for their root cause analysis. We have yet to receive a response in meetings. We've discussed first checking that the material meets with the contract specifications. They haven't gone beyond that. And we haven't gotten a list of whether they've checked their torquing and um, installation and things like that. So we are still awaiting that evaluation from Kiwit. Because the rail, the, 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 the steel rails are placed on top of these things, Correct. Right? Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Chalico. So it could be that over torquing is the root cause of the problem and not uh, UV deterioration? Again, we're in the middle of evaluating all the root mm -hmm. causes. Under design build, Kiwit needs to give us that information. Um, as a group, we've decided to start with the specifications, making sure the material itself meets the contract requirements. If that's not the case, then we would move on. But internally, the discussion with Kiwit and their, um, their designer has wanted to evaluate this first. Any other questions here? Kainani. Uh, Whenever we use materials, I assume this is design build. Correct. So did the designer approve the material and say it is to specifications? Yes. Usually so, we, we get a certificate of compliance that comes from the manufacturers. There were several, um, LB Foster was the manufacturer on KKJV and there were three manufacturers for the Wolf and KHG contract. Those were all certified for Wolf KHG, we are awaiting the certificate of, certificate of compliance, and when we do receive those, the engineer of record um, provides a stamp of approval or acceptance. So who provided the stamp of approval? For HNTV. HNTV. Well, we have a change order coming up on HNTV. <laughs> it just happens. Now, in, in looking at the uh, report, the PMOC report, they said they, they first noticed that, I think in October of 2015, there was another reference in December of 2015, then there was January 2015, and there was February 2015. The one that I know, because it came up in our discussion, was in the March of 2015. One of the things that the, um, the PMO seemed to say is that they are that Hart may accept the shims as a resolution to the plinthless system, and that Hart should be entitled to some sort of credit from Kiwi. Are you aware? Are you aware of that? Currently, we don't have resolution on the cost or warranty issue associated with the height adjustment issue we just discussed. So is that is still internally being um, discussed. So is the PMO um, okay, for lack of a better description, with the use of the shims to adjust for the height? I don't know if I can speak to that. Uh, Chair. Yes. Board members, Chris Takashi, uh, Design and Construction. As uh, we've mentioned this numerous times in the PMOC monthly meetings. They have not um, expressed uh, a negative opinion as to us using the plants. And um, as you know, as Kanani mentioned, we brought in a peer review group from all mm -hmm. over the all over the nation, including Canada, um, come in from uh, different agencies and uh, asked us. Uh, we asked them to take a look at the recommendation. And this is actually these type of uh, adjustments are used all over the place. And so, um, as far as we know, the PMOC is probably okay with uh, us doing this. In other words, they haven't said no. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Because the way they, they write it, um, it, it is, this is in the March, the one we talked about, Chris. 
it says that the hard engaged technical staff from other transit uh, agencies to complete a peer review for the of the situation and provide some recommendations. Indications are that Hart will accept shimming of the track and will request a credit from Kiwit, but it doesn't say that they find it to be the acceptable resolution to this. So the problem, the other problem is what Kainani also touched upon, that for some reason you cannot shim more than two inches. And in fact, the specifications say you are not going to shim more than 9 sixteenths. So what I assume we're doing for anything up to two inches is we're just laying these things one on top of each other. Is that correct? And kind of bolting them down? Yes. And I remember in March when we, I mean in April when we talked about this, because this is in the March PMOC report, Chris, the, uh, the issue was the blue ones were failing and the black ones were not for some reason. Is that correct? But it, the sample you brought us, and I don't know if it's just a sample, the black ones are very thin, and the blue ones are the ones that are varying in sizes. We have thick black ones as well. You have the thick black ones yes. as well. Do you know how much it costs if the 1,066, well, 165,000 pieces are to be replaced? I think 100 are at rock, right? Isn't it 100? 100. All right, rock. Yes. So that's still 1,500, whatever it is, that's still left. And those are going to be on the rail itself, correct? On the on track, the, on the rail track. Isolation pads and KKJV is committed to replacing those for the MSF contract. So they are going to replace it without any cost to hard. Because I know they supplied it, but replacing is another different situation. So are they going to do both? For the ones at MSF. Oh, yeah. No, I know that one. I'm yes. talking about the rail. I mean, that's easy. That's on flat ground. What about the ones on the top? That is currently under evaluation. I believe Kiwit is, again, they haven't responded to us with their um, steps for remediation. Um, on Wolf, there are 55,000 locations that have been installed, and KHG is currently being installed. So really, going backwards to Wolf will be the issue that's currently being evaluated by Kiwit. Currently, you know, verifying the root cause that it is a material issue and that it, it eliminating torque or any other root causes, they will have to come with their proposal on how they plan to remediate that. Now, and I didn't ask this of Taka earlier, we're talking about tendons. Is there any chance that Kiwit's going to come back with a change order on heart and say somehow it's heart's fault on the tendons? And the same question to you, Kainani. Is there any chance on that? Uh, I, I don't believe so. I mean, so far what Kiwit has been doing is they've, they've actually been taking it upon themselves to do these things, and they'll, they'll come back to us and say these are the things that we are doing to address this problem. So what we've been trying to do is put it squarely in their court saying this is a this is a problem that you're experiencing and it's your responsibility to remedy it and and report back to us so at, at this point that's right we need to know how much because one of the difference between the tendon issue and the shim issue is that the pmo clearly notes that uh heart may accept the shims as a resolution to the the basically the distance on the track but it should be receiving a credit from Kiwit on this. But the problem I see is, you know, what is the actual cost, Kainani, of replacing these shims? Because if we know they're failing, we, have, we don't even have load on it yet, right? We don't have any load on it. And, uh, and the fact that our specification says 9 sixteenths and we're willing to accept 2 inches, that to me is, 2 inches is quite a bit especially if you're putting the load on it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we're going to accept two inches, there's something that has to be of compensation because I, I think we're, we're in for trouble. And if it's two inches more than two inches, they're going to do a plinth-like system. Mm -hmm. So they're going to pour additional concrete with rebars in it, I assume? Yes. Mini plinth. Mini plinths. But isn't also the problem the fact that these tracks are... What are the, what's the word? Cambered? So that they're sort of bold and they're supposed to fall in the middle. And so, but you, I think you said that it's not expected to be a major, I guess, evening out. 
but we're still going to have some adjustment that's going to have to be made as it bows down. Is that correct? My understanding, and I am not the, the maintenance part of HART, is shim, replacement and inspection of SHIM is going to be an ongoing program. Um, when we get to the cost issue that you had referred to, that's currently under evaluation. Um, we internally need to come to some position on the, the vertical height adjustment. And once we get um, information back from our independent lab on the material issue, we can then proceed to looking at replacement. And um, if, if any of it is ours, I, again, it's a design build contract. Mm -hmm. Their designers stamped and certified the materials. Um, my opinion is it's design build and it's on them, to, it's on them. To, to do it. But again, internally, we haven't come to a consensus or position on those issues yet because we're still evaluating some of that. And, you know, I, I, I'm requesting again that on behalf of the board that you bring it back before you do any kind of uh, acceptance. And simply because the PMO says that you're entitled to credit and, well, CARD is entitled to credit. And I don't want us to go down the road of these change orders without having credit that, that is due to HART as part of the equation. And not to put um, our friend uh, Ford on the line, but in the August PMO report, <laughs> it says HDOT submitted a letter to HART requesting a corrective action plan for rail shims being installed on the guideway. So this is HDOT. So I'm assuming this is HDOT's role in terms of their safety component. That is correct. Yeah. And we are, by the way, we were warned in San Francisco that there is um, 49 CFR 574, if my memory serves me correct. And if we do not, if HDOT doesn't comply with that and do what it's supposed to do, they can cut our real funding off. So if HDOT wants us to be very careful about this, I assume that's something else that uh, we're expecting to be briefed on as well, Executive Director Formby. So Chair, we had a meeting this week with uh, Brandon and Ed at the State Safety Office regarding the State Safety Office function, and this was one of the topics of discussion. And um, we will agree to come back to the board when we're in a position to make a recommendation as to the resolution. We're just not there yet. Mr. And Mr. Director of DOT. I, you and I had this discussion. Right. Uh, and again, uh, we do not have an appropriation to fund exactly what FDA, FDA is asking us to fund. So I would ask the board uh, to give us time uh, through this session to go ahead and ask the uh, legislature for the funds. Basically what FDA is saying that uh, the role of the safety uh, uh, manager and the DOT uh, cannot be affiliated at all with HART. Currently HART is providing us with funds under the original agreement right. at the time. Um, that being said, they did give us to 2019, which is something that we're, we're really to, to take a look at. But at the end of the day, without the uh, appropriation, I can't do anything even if I wanted to. That's right. And, and we have that discussion because um, without Hart's money, you can't do it. But, but Hart can't give you any money, right. according to the FDA. But notwithstanding, there is a letter, I assume, from HDOT to Hart about this specific issue and um, we're going to have to come up with some resolution because it's now a safety issue as well. Because there's got to be something about, I can see on flat ground, but on the rail itself, how do you, you know, that's, that's, that's an issue. If, you, if you're only permitted spec-wise to go 9 sixteenths and you're saying we're going to go up to 2 inches, there's something wrong with that. 9 sixteenths is a little over half an inch. And we're gonna we're gonna quadruple that, plus your isolation pad. So, and then you're gonna have a plinth plinth system if it goes over two inches. So that tells me there's something wrong with the rail, the pouring of that guideway. If we gotta have all these alternatives, because when we so to save seven point five five million dollars, we now have this issue. 
I know it's not us. It is, as I always say, this is pre-heart, but notwithstanding, we're left cleaning it up. So, mm -hmm. members, any other questions? No? And so we expect a report back, and please address Mr. Calicombe's torque, because if torque is a problem with just torquing it down, imagine when we have the rail running on it. Yes, Mr. Calicombe. I do have a question. Yes. Oh. Uh, on the torquing, uh, was uh, this done by hand or was this done uh, uh, by automation? Um, there is a, a machine that does that, um, and so it is um, calibrated. Well, all torque is calibrated. Yeah. I'm mean, right. just wondering how it was uh, performed up, you know, on, the, on the job site. Mm -hmm. Should I get uh, some background on that? On how it's done? Yes. Um, uh, the machinery that's used, or uh, yes. um, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, basically a big, uh, yeah, big, basically it looks like a big torque wrench that you put down over the the bolt, and mm -hmm. you push a button, sort of like a drill, and it it drills the uh, the anchor bolt into the uh, insert. Okay, so it's not done by hand. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's not like a... Yeah, that's, that's, that's my question. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No? Thank you very much. These are all informational. We also have, um, is there any reason why members you might want to go into executive session? This is not over, so we're going to be continuing to discuss it. Hearing no requests, let's move on to... Uh, number 10, which is uh, change orders. John Moore. Mr. War, I have a quorum for purposes of hearing your presentation, but we do not have a quorum for purposes of taking action. So I will afford you the opportunity to decide whether you want to defer this till we have the people who would be voting on this to the next meeting. What do you think, Mr. Executive Director? Well, I'm, I'm concerned that the people that are not here that might be voting on the issue would not be privy to the knowledge that's being communicated today. So unless John and Sam have some reason for wanting to make the presentation today. If it's not going to go to vote, we might want to defer. So you're, you're going to have to rebrief to the extent that somebody that's going to be asked to vote is not going to have the knowledge that was communicated today. We agree with you that okay. we should have the appropriate people here. All right. So, we so, so we'll defer? If you, if you don't mind, we'd like you to defer, please. We will consider. defer. We're very you. sorry, John, but we lost quorum, voting quorum. Thank you. So number 11, project and traffic update. Chris Takashige, Kainani Kraut, Nick Ching. Not that we don't like hearing you guys, but can you just uh, give us highlights and not go through the whole <laughs> thing? It's all highlights now. It's all we, highlights. We've changed the briefing. Oh, you have? Thank you. All right. Aloha. Aloha. It's Kainani Kraut with um, the West Side Construction Management. So I'm just going to hit the highlights. Okay. And the one big highlight is the Cam Highway, Cam Highway Station Group. We are issuing NTP next week. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Seriously, that's the highlight. That's not. And the, the rest, we're just proceeding. Um, December 1st, MSF, we're looking for final acceptance. Um, yeah. No, the rest were just building. Do you want to do airport? Not really. Okay. Airport utility contract is winding up. And then the airport guideway contract, the projected NTP 
coming in the next couple months. Couple months? October? November? Oh, October. I think it's a couple months, so I'm thinking a couple months from now is. Trying to uh, still yeah. In October? And just for the public, uh, it will be issued to whom? What's it? Who's the um, design? This is design build as well, right? So who's the designer for this project? Is it part of the three names? No. Oh. OK. No, I thought it was one of the, the names. OK. Anything else, Kainani, on your side? Now, OK, Nick Ching yes. for East Side or whatever. <laughs> Hello, Hubborn, Madam Chair, Nick Ching, uh, Heart Traffic Engineer. These are just uh, high-level updates on, uh, tra on traffic uh, throughout uh, Barrington and Kamehameha. So I'll just start with these few slides here. So the, uh, in Barrington, it's really just various daytime and nighttime closures um, all along uh, Barrington. In Kamehameha, uh, H1 in Pearl City, there's a uh, the standard night closures on eastbound and westbound H1 in Pearl City uh, through uh, November of this year. Uh, moving along in Pearl City, uh, there's, night, there's a nightly westbound conch flow between Kuliana Road and Pooh Pony Street um, for balanced cantilever structure through November of this year also for moving equipment. Um, all left turns are closed at Kuliana and the detours at Kahumana Street. And the um, Near Pearl Ridge, there's intersection closures during nighttime and daytime uh, off peak, uh, starting right now at Kanuku Street for segment installation. Uh, there's any left turn closures starting around now through mid October, and the detours are at the adjacent, adjacent intersections at Hikaha and Kanohi Street. Move along to Aiea. At nighttime, there's full detours between Kanuku and Kahoni. Kaonohi streets for utility and equipment removal through November. And as you can see, the detour is along Wanalua Loop. Uh, down by uh, Aya Halava Stadium area, there's a 24 7 westbound concha flow over there through uh, November of this year, also. And uh, for the airport um, utilities, uh, there's various daytime closures over here, also through November. Any questions, members? Not. Thank you. So, Chair, yes. can I get one clarification? I'd like Sam to come up. It has to do with the NTP on the Shimmick contract, and it relates to the interim plan and the pacing of expenditures. So I don't want to leave the board with the impression that we are absolutely issuing NTP in October, and Sam can clarify that. As a part of the... Um, uh, request from um, Carolyn Flowers, the FTA administrator, and uh, as a result of our meeting, one of the things that they were concerned about was the pacing of our expenditures over the next nine months until we make a decision uh, on whether we can go ahead with Plan uh, A. Um, to accommodate that, we're looking at ways that um, we can uh, adjust um, the, the payments that we were making out. NTP is one of the considerations. At the same time, we've been talking to Shimmick, and even though our plan, our original plan, was to give out the NTP shortly after we got to uh, go ahead for, um, uh, on the contract, and we were projecting October, we're now uh, talking to the contractor, and we could um, possibly extend it out more to the end of the year. That would help with the um, uh, payments, the funding, um, and um, it would accommodate uh, some of the requests that FTA has made. So, uh, Chris, you have something to add? Uh, Sam's, uh, Sam gave you one side. The other side is that actually the request would have to come from Shimmick Trailer and Granite. Um, and they have verbally <clears throat> talked to us about it. We have not received anything in writing from them. One of the reasons is uh, we have a requirement to hold prices up to a certain date, which is December 17th. And so any type of requests would have to come from them, from their side, not from our side. 
uh, that is to get us through the holidays, to get through. Mm. So they don't staff up through the holidays where nothing happens, you know. So that's one of the reasons it's in discussion. That was going to be my question, which is, you know, uh, there was an issue, as you know, because one of the things that, that the PMO said early on was that we shouldn't be issuing contracts, but we issued this contract. And now if we, I, I, I want to know what are the consequences. Are we going to have delay claims against us? If we don't issue the NTP, we'll be okay? No, so that's the point that, that Chris made is the appropriate point. If the contractor makes the request to us that we delay NTP, then we will consider that. But I don't want you to think that, that we've absolutely agreed to issue NTP in October if they come forward and request an extension. It would not be a change order. It would be an accommodation on their behalf. But then if Chris also said earlier that we anticipate issuing NTP in October, which seems to be contrary to what Sam is saying that Carolyn Flowers, and I believe that is the request, they do not want to see us incur any costs in the interim while we're discussing this. So my question is, do we have to issue NTP if it is not requested by Shimek that we withhold it? Contractually, yes. By December 17th. Right. And if we don't, we're going to stand the hit for increased costs. That's correct. So I'd like to ask a rhetorical question. So why did we do it? Huh? Why did we do it then? Anyway, members, any questions? Not? Thank you very much. But Sam, stay there because what I'm going to do is, I, because I don't know at what point I'm going to lose quorum. Not that Jesse Suki, you're not important. Important and Chris Takashige, you're not important. But I want to get to the, um, I want to skip to item number 17. I think that's where we are. And that's basically the um, PMOC, well, it's not the PMOC report, it is the contract packaging plan. Oh, 16. 16. Sam? Yes. Sam, can Corey join you on this? Sure. That would be good. Members, uh, just as background, as you know, one of the things that uh, we have been trying to do is to come up with a way that everyone, including the public and us, can easily refer to where we are on this project. So this is what I call my 11 by 17. Michael Formby, when he sat on this side, used to call this his budget book. But what it does is it gives us, with one glance, where this project is. And I'm calling your attention, uh, people, to the fact that we have some change in estimates again. So, Sam, please. Unless, yes, Mike, do you want to say something first? Yeah, I think I'd just make an introductory comment that, that historically, uh, the agency has been faulted for the constant change in project estimate and and we've taken that to heart and what we've what we've been focusing on for the last I'd say six months if not more is combining not only the estimation side but the risk management side and I did ask that Alex Cross be prepared to brief the board at the October meeting on the new risk management risk assessment program that we have that's now actively being used because I think the two together the estimation side and the risk assessment side bring us better focus on what the potential cost for project delivery are. And so the numbers that are being presented today is staff's best um, estimate as to where we will be at project completion. Okay, Sam. Okay, um, yes, Chair. Um, if I may mention on the sidebar, today is my anniversary of two years at heart. Oh, uh, congratulations. I know, I know that it sort of coincides with your six months as chair <laughs> and your 15 months being on the board. Right. Um, I also note that um, out of all the board members, you were one of the people who signed off on the full funding grant agreement. And so I know the fact that the cost has increased since then is, is a pretty sensitive issue with you. Um, and in the time that I've been here, um, internally we've dis discussed the uh, different numbers. And since um, um, Executive Director Formby's been on board, 
he has insisted that we get to the right number and um, share it and be completely open about where we stand. Um, we've done that. Um, at the PMO suggestion, we've implemented a risk management program. We brought um, a consultant team in to work with one of our managers to school him in the risk management tool. And as Director Formby has mentioned, uh, you'll get that presentation next month. But we've used that tool to go over all of the numbers that we have here and we've put in contingency for every item. We feel very confident on every item. And even though Director Formby said that, um, that this is the estimated cost that we expect for the job, actually we expect the price to be lower than this. Okay? This is a number that has contingency in it that covers each of the contracts that we have here. It was thoughtfully done through a risk management tool, um, but we're going to manage to a number less than this. Every one of the contracts that we have here is, um, has been evaluated. Hey, we've looked at the uh, risks that are associated with it, and then we are assigning our project managers a responsibility that's less than the number that we're um, assigning to each of the projects. What you have here is a listing of the current value of each of these, and we brought the contingency down to the bottom. Okay, and you'll see it's a substantial number, and it's much higher than what was in the original uh, full funding grant agreement. Okay, but the number is also higher than what we told you a number of months ago. Okay, um, I think that the number that we had uh, put out there before was um, 6.8. Okay, and and I don't know um, when that was, whether it was six months ago or not. But the um, significant items that we've changed is uh, alone, the largest one is city center contract that we're um, thinking about putting out next year. Okay? We obviously can't put it on the street because we don't have the money right now. But that was a substantial increase <laughs> of a half a million dollars. And that's because <coughs> of half a billion, I'm sorry, half a billion dollars. And that's because of what we've discovered along there, the, the utilities, not only HECO, but other utilities that are along that area that, um, unfortunately, Dillingham is just completely crowded with utilities. And it's, uh, we talked about the alignments when we went over the options earlier in the summer. And it's a, um, unfortunately, it's the only area that we can go through right now. So that number jumped up a half a million dollars by itself. We have also had a number of items with regards to um, half, a billion. half a billion, I'm sorry. It's hard to say. Yeah. It's hard to swallow that number, yeah. it really is. Uh, and um, also, HECO itself. Has, uh, we're still working with HECO. We're trying to knock the cost down. But again, if there's a possibility that the cost is going to be in a certain um, area, we're going to put the money in there to cover that, and we're going to work to knock it down. And that's what we're doing with um, HECO right now. As an example, um, they're looking at different ways where we can take some of the overhead lines, we can buy them some equipment, which is much less, and we can um, uh, alleviate their concerns without having to underground uh, certain bits of our construction. Um, those um, vehicles, uh, they are, are sending a team over to the mainland, uh, that's the plan, uh, to look at these particular vehicles, and if it works, it'll save us a substantial amount of money. But again, I want to emphasize the fact that we've thoughtfully done this. We think this is the number. We don't think there's going to be any other changes in what we come back to you, and we're prepared to take this and put it in our financial plan uh, that Hart will forward um, probably at the um, beginning of November, have it completed at the uh, end of November. <coughs> Members, any questions? Questions? S Sam, as you know, <laughs> I've seen every version of this uh, from the first time when I saw it at the PMOC meeting of some version of it. What I want to be clear about is now we, and I know that uh, Marcel's headline's going to be tomorrow, 8.629.951 billion dollars is the estimated cost of the mm -hmm. rail. But what 
when you look at this, you have subtotal of 6.785, but what boosts that number is one point, almost $1.4 billion worth of contingency. Just so that we're clear, the old figures that we used to look at, like 6.8, 7.9, those included contingency before, correct? That is correct. So the other thing that's in here that is, so now we've stripped out for all of these contracts, whatever contingency number we used to think that they had associated with them. That's also correct, right? Correct. So, so that when we talk about city center at 1.384 billion, that is city center, that's, that's famous Dillingham Boulevard and everything from Middle Street to Ala Moana, we're looking at that without any contingency. That is what you think, if it, if it was a perfect world and you didn't have any contingency, any change orders, that's what it will cost. Yes. That's quite a, that's quite a bit. That would be our bid price, yeah. yeah. So the other thing that I noticed in here is uh, just because, you know, utilities has been an issue for me from the get-go, the West Side Utilities clearance issue, it was zero, which it was because everyone said there is no issue on the full funding grant agreement in 2012, and now we're 200 million. Mm -hmm. is, and that's not, a, that's not a contingency, that's the amount that we think. It's going to be. So we think, in addition, so had this been something that um, he now, would... Uh, let, me, let me be clear. Okay. If you underground it all, right. it's $200 million. We don't think we're going to have to do that. Okay. But okay, we but were at zero before for anything. Absolutely. So uh, we are going to probably have some costs associated with that, right? Of course. Because more than likely, we probably will have to underground the 138 KVs because, quite honestly, I don't think there's going to be any kind of machine that's going to be able to safely uh, do the 138. You're probably but, correct. But so it's somewhere between zero and 200 million that, is a that we're statement. going to be looking that is at. Correct. And the issue that we talked about with uh, uh, our friend uh, Director Fujikami earlier that we still are carrying is in the section called professional services contracts. And that is the H. Dot, um, uh, Sa State Safety Oversight Consultant, right? Mm -hmm. So as it stands here, we are at about 1.272 bi uh, million, billion, million, and then it's estimated to go up to 1.855 million. Just so that we're talking about the same thing. I don't expect it to be that high unless the director ha has a lot of overhead that he puts on. Yeah, and well, that was my other question. I mean, yeah. it doesn't seem like all that cost is associated with us yeah. because the budget that Brandon, who runs oversees that area that submitted to me that we're going to put in appropriations is not that high. So No, I don't think it is. Yeah. And, and it depends on whether you go consultant uh, to do this no, job or not. Right? You're going to yeah. do it in-house? Yeah, you know what, why don't we have Brandon speak okay. to Brandon is and again, we've been working on trying to establish um, coming up with a budget for the uh, legislature. Okay. And, they did, and you did have a consultant. Right. Okay. Yeah, I apologize. I didn't bring my paperwork. No, no, that's I all right. speak to this issue. Um, so, oh, sorry. My name is Brandon Eschenar with HDOT State Safety Oversight, just for the record. So the $1.85 million is the original contract amount. That's broken up into two parts. There's the project management consultant contract and then the project manager. I'm the project manager and the um, 1.2 is the remaining balance. We no longer have a consultant on board so the money that's held aside for the consultant is frozen right now. So we're just paying the project manager position at this point. And you know that we can't pay after a while so you would have to find your own money. We're very yeah, sorry. We're, we're FDA very says that. we can't pay for That's you why he anymore. That's my office all year, almost every day now. That's right. <laughs> so I'm very sorry, but we can't pay for you. FDA said we can't. So, but anyway, and it, you have to 2019. Just in so case he didn't tell you, we have to 2019 to figure this out. Right, and that's something that we discussed uh, while we're trying to go ahead and uh, move this thing forward. We want to get it done sooner than later in terms of the appropriation, so that when 2019 does come around, actually we'll be ready to go ahead and. 
you know what, it, it might be sooner than the 2019, but we do have to 2019 to get it done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks So Sam, uh, how often do you and Corey envision that you're going to be changing these numbers? As far as we're concerned, we're setting the budget now. We, of course, are going to, the numbers change every week, okay? But we are setting a budget, and then now it will be our projections compared to this as far as we're concerned. And, I mean, that's what I'm offering, but uh, the uh, executive director has to sign off on it also. So just so that, so, Corey, in a perfect world situation, this would be your EAC? You, you host up all acronyms. Your estimate at completion, is that what this is? For the record, Corey uh, Ellis, Project Controls. Well, I think like Sam alluded to, we, we, what we expect is this, this budget will contain our estimate at completion. It'll be something less than, I mean, that's the expectation we're going to manage to. Okay. So members, any questions? Yes. Mr. Um, I see in the uh, uh, summary uh, the one area that there's a reduction um, in the uh, cost is the uh, park and ride final design from 2.4 million to um, 795. And I was just wondering, for my own edification, could I get an update on um, where we're at with the park and rides? Uh, yeah. So as far as the uh, reduction, so some of that scope was transferred into another package. Um, so what you notice in this sheet and, um, is Column A kind of represented some of our original plan. We've done a lot of changes to our contract packaging, and we've done transfers from that budget to the appropriate contracts. Um, so some of that scope was transferred into one of the, into the station uh, contract itself or the station designer. Um, and then as far as park and ride lots go itself, um, we are still planning on building those lots. We do have uh, options of temporary and permanent facilities that we have to prepare for. Uh, but those are underway, and I'm assuming Sam or Chris can speak more to that. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, yes. nope. Mark and then nope. Terrence. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this list, uh, thank you very much, by the way, for this. I mean, this is extremely transparent, and, and I think we really, everyone here really appreciates, appreciates that. Um, this does include, to play off on what uh, Art was saying, this includes all of the park and ride facilities, including um, at Pearl Highlands, including the on-ramps from, from H2, absolutely everything that we committed to in the, in the original full funding grant agreement is, is listed in here. Is that That's correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Terry. Um, so, I mean, since, since this proposed budget um, already takes into account the airport contract that was awarded, so the only remaining contract we've got to award is, is City Center and Pro Highlands. And Pearl Highlands. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in the footnote, it says City, it, it assumes City Center, Guideway, and Stations contract has an NTP in August 2018. So it's assuming a contract award in what, t next year sometime? Okay. And, and so the, the, So what I'm trying to what I'm trying to get a feel for is, you know, what's the likelihood we're going to get more surprises down the road in terms of cost escalations and that sort of thing. Uh, I'm just trying to get it because you know that's been our history, right? And, it, it, and so has. We, we need it to has. manage those expectations. It has, and we and and we've gone over it in in detail. We've extended out. To be honest with you, the fact that the the overall, what we call RSD, revenue service date, has extended out so far, it's increased all of the um, soft cost, if you call it. Okay? And, and what we're doing that for how much a year? $80 million a year, just for the soft cost every year that we go out and everything. So um, our best estimate right now is that we have it covered. Okay? But, but then again, we have to make sure everybody does their job. Okay, we have to make sure that um, Park gets what we're entitled to, and to be honest with you, our philosophy is treat the money as if it's our money, because it is our money. Because I own a house here, and I have kids in school, and everything like that, and we're paying that tax, and that's that's the viewpoint that we're taking now. 
Thank you. And Chair, can yes. I just clarify, and I know you know this, but maybe for the new board members. <coughs> so for the purpose of this presentation, they dropped all the contingencies that are allocated on the various contracts down to the bottom. And that was for proprietary reasons, because we don't want any one contractor to know the contingency that we've set aside for their contract. So that's why it's at the bottom, but in reality, they have gone project by project and done the risk assessment models, the cost estimate models, the contingency models on every line. Yes. May I ask one more question. Sure. So um, uh, what is the assumed schedule now uh, for completion all the way to Alamoana Center based on the cost estimates that you have here? Right now we're saying December 2025. And we're trying to work back from there. Uh, Chris Takashiki has her, his team that is um, working with the different consultants and contractors, and we're trying to push that back to gain uh, more contingency in our schedule. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, yes. Mr. Fujigami. Sam, j just to the question, the overall project we're, we're projecting to be somewhere around $8.6 mm -hmm. How much have we actually paid out to date? So. If we were to say what the actual cost of the uh, projected budget would be from today, what would that amount be? I don't, um, you know. So um, we've incurred uh, approximately uh, $2.3 billion of costs. So that leaves a work remaining of about $4.5 billion. Um, so you got $4.5 billion worth of costs left, and you're estimating that your contingency for the 4.5 is going to be somewhere around $1.4 billion? That's the amount. Yeah, yeah, that's that is actually correct. So, okay. knowing the amount of contingency that you had to pay out on the west side, which, to be honest with you, I think the reason why we started on the west side was because of the fact that you know, we didn't, you didn't anticipate much problems on the west side. Now that we're coming into town, I mean, I know people think 1.4 billion is a lot of money, but is that enough? Well, we took that into consideration. We looked at it and. We think it is, okay? But admittedly, the most challenging part is Dillingham. And, and um, it, it's, obviously it's a concern. We have to manage it well, okay? But we do think it's enough. But managing it is one thing. Unexpected items that pop up is another. And I think, you know, just with the undergrounding of the util utilities, I know Mark and, and, and Mike will also tell you because we run into it, you know, a lot of the as built and, you know, the documents that are out there, sometimes it really doesn't show, you know, what, what you run into. And while this, this, this next phase is not, you know, is, is very, very important, you have, you know, the unexpected, what you're going to run into. You're going to have all this business disruption that you're going to run into. I don't know if Hart's actually going to be, you know, how much they get involved when it comes to, you know, uh, moving some of the transportation, public transportation around from the routes that are there and it's moving forward. So, I mean, I'm just trying to protect you guys. I, I, 1.4 billion, well, I, I think it is, it is a good amount. I don't know if it's solid because a couple or, or three times you actually made the statement that you think you're going to go less than the 8.6. I mean, you really think you're going to go less than 8.6 knowing that there potentially could be a lot of problems coming up? Well, we're going to, we, we have up to now, we have up to now, and we will run this through, and we'll, and we'll bring your points up at our uh, PMO meeting, which we have one coming next week. And, um, and they do their own validation of these numbers. Okay, so, thanks. But I, I, I appreciate the heads up, your concerns, and um, I'll take it as a warning. So and I, and if I can add, board member uh, Fujikami, that we had a three-hour meeting yesterday and it was all about utilities on the Dillingham corridor. It's all about city center and utilities. And that was part of the discussion that we had is that I said, we're getting ready to put a project cost estimate into a very political environment where we're making requests for additional sources of revenue to get to Alamoana Center. And what we cannot be doing is coming back in November and saying, well, now it's 8.7 and in January it's 8.8. .8. We can't do that. And so they know the charge, and they came here today with this number. They're comfortable that they built the contingency in based upon the known risk and the unknown risk. Corey, did you have something to add? 
I was just going to make uh, just a comment for what, for what it's worth. The FTA did recently do a risk refresh, and they had a recommended contingency of around 20 percent, a little bit higher than 20 percent. Uh, the 1.4 billion of contingency, based off of the work remaining, would represent 30 percent of contingency. So we do feel we have sufficient enough contingency. Again, we can't say if we know everything. There's a lot of unknowns, but we do feel from what we know today, we should be able to contain it within this budget. Would you happen to know what the percentage is of the contingency to date, based on what you paid out already? I don't have that number off the top of my head, but I can, I can definitely get, get that. that to Thanks. Yeah. Terry? Um, and just for, for mine and I think the general public's edification, you know, we all hear about the PMOC report saying that it could be as much as 10 point something billion dollars. I mean, how, how, reconcile for me how, you know, we're coming up with this 8.6 billion, doing our own risk assessment, and then why does the PMOC come up with 10 point something billion on, on, an, out, on an outside number? You, you have to understand the, the number that they put out there is 10, 10 point whatever billion it is. Okay. It was based on a projection of projects that they considered to be similar across the United States. It was more FTA than the PMO, to be honest with you. If you look back at the PMO's numbers, their number actually was 7.6 <coughs> or 8, something in there, and then you add uh, finance and contingency on top of that. Actually, we're probably a little higher than what their number is, and we'll confirm that over the next couple of um, uh, weeks. But the um, number that you that everybody is touting, the, the 10 and whatever, came from the FTA going back and picking what they considered to be similar jobs, um, uh, maybe like a, what would you call it, like a, a para estimate um, uh, across the United States. And that was, if you'll read it, it says the highest bound. Okay. And so, believe me, um, they've asked us not to quote them anymore on, on that number, okay? And they did in the interim plan that we're putting together. We, we shared some of the information with them, and they said, we'd prefer you not to put that out there. And this is from a guy, for, for those of you who don't know, I worked at the FDA, okay? I was the director of engineering, and I, and I know how um, we put these numbers out, but the, um, uh, I, I would go with what they currently estimate and I think over the next month, as they re-examine our numbers, you'll see that we're, we're pretty much in conjunction with where they are. Thank you. And Sam, I just want to add, though, in the 2014 risk refresh, their 100% outer bound number was $7.6 billion. You are correct. So if, I assume the methodology is correct, or this is very similar between 2014 risk refresh and 2016 risk refresh. So the only, I think, the issue that uh, Terry Lee makes is, is well-founded, which is, okay, but they're at 10 point something now, 10.6 or 7, whatever it was. If we didn't have 2020 hindsight in 2014, I, I think you're right. That may be not be a figure that we would quote or we would give any credence to, but I think we would be absolutely foolish not to realize or recognize that it does exist and for some reason, they hit it on the nose. Whatever modeling they use, they hit it on the nose. Matter of fact, they're kind of under in 2014. So, Chair, if I can just yes. add to that conversation. The difficulty that we have, and, and I agree, historically, you look at it, it's, it's right. The difficulty we have is defending a number that we don't have a cost estimate or a risk assessment basis for supporting. So we did consider, we did talk about putting in a $500 million reserve. You know, just to put a reserve on top of contingency, just a reserve of $500 million, but it becomes just that. It's just a placeholder. There's no evidence-based or fact-based number for coming to that position. So I, I think the reality is, even though we're at 8.6, nobody would go to those that have the power to give us a revenue stream and claim you should not give us any more than 8.6. We want more than 8.6 because the history is unknowns have come and have caused us to blow our budget. But for the purposes of being able to defend the budget, this is where we're at today. Any other questions or comments? Thank you very much. But I still think you shouldn't ignore it, Sam. <laughs> 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 They're right. They have been right. Sam, don't move, because I just want to move uh,
down quickly because I'm at some point going to lose quorum quorum. So we've, the August PMOC uh, consultant report is you. Is there anything you want to add other than the fact that we've talked about the tendons and the shims that have been discussed in there? Um, anything else in particular? So well, thank you, Corey. Can, can Jill join? Uh, Jill prepares the progress report, and okay. she was going to speak very briefly to the changes that are taking place in the progress report and how we think it will be more meaningful to She's the board. She's on the monthly progress report. Yeah. Sam's yeah. on the PMOC. The okay. Um, we'll go to Jill after you. <laughs> yeah, I, I do have um, a very short note for, for the chair um, because um, the reference to the uh, cost uh, containment and cost reductions. You, right. You said that the PMO has mentioned that um, in the past. Um, Actually, every single report, Sam, since I've been on it, I went back and checked. <laughs> so it's more than in the past. Sorry. Okay. Um, yes, but um, do, do you mind me quoting one? No. no. Okay. In July 2016, their statement was that the PMOC has discussed the project cost with HART on a monthly basis in an effort to um, ensure cost issues are proactively addressed. HART has recently implemented cost containment and cost reduction measures in an effort to mitigate the cost increase. These efforts include, and they go through a listing of, of different items that they are have there. I want to assure you that we do have a listing of cost reductions and secondary mitigations. I just want to show you here that, um, a la John Moore, I did bring my paperwork uh, with me. Um, and we do take it seriously. We do consider each of these. But obviously, as we go further and further through the project, it's more and more difficult to get uh, cost reductions of any substantial amount of money. Once you make the design decisions, such as um, uh, different types of uh, uh, materials that you're using on the project, whether it's a uh, stainless steel or a certain type of glass or whatever, they're pretty much set in motion. At one time, they considered taking out some of the uh, canopies. And again, I've only been here two years. A lot of this uh, predates me. But I think uh, a lot of people early on made good efforts to try to reduce the cost where they can. Right now, we have, as, as um, uh, Board Member Lee pointed out, we only have two contracts left. And we're taking a look at those to see uh, where we can make changes without costing um, uh, the heart project any quality. At one point, um, when I first came on board, there was consideration of reducing or eliminating escalators throughout the system. OK? Uh, obviously, a number of these thoughts that go out there uh, affect the political landscape also. And so we have, honestly, uh, and I have the list here of a number of items that we've gone through and we've proposed and for one reason or another uh, Many of them haven't been implemented, but many have been implemented Changing concrete mixes changing some of the uh, requirements with regards to that changing the specialty license for um, uh, Subcontractors uh, their submission requirements uh, try to work with the um, contractors and um, ma Make it a better system for them to to, to come into and like John Moore, I also have my... Yeah, I know too. without a doubt you do. <laughs> so the, 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 the phrase that you read is, yeah. is actually there from my first, my first uh, PMO report. Yeah. And that is that they discussed the project costs on a monthly basis and Hart, uh, in an effort to ensure that cost issues are proactively addressed, Hart has recently implemented cost containment and they see this every single month. Every single month. And they also say, however, that it is anticipated the project costs will exceed the FFTA budget. The only reason I raised the project, the cost containment model, is because this is what they told us in San Francisco. They did. That still is not to their satisfaction. So irrespective, I think we have, a, we have an issue on how we do that uh, and how we address that, that particular issue which is the cost containment. So we have to come to some sort of way so that uh, the PMO won't put that same paragraph in every single month. They kind of change it a little bit here and there. But basically, it's the same thing every month. 
Well, but they do add one thing in the well, mid-March, and that is review of contract general terms and conditions to eliminate unique conditions and ambiguity that result in added cost. I think they started to put that in in March of, 20, of 2016. I think that is absolutely correct. And that is a problem that we have, and I've asked the executive director to look into this, which is the contract interpretations. Yes. What is it that we're, we have contracted for? We are entitled to the benefit of our bargain. And we have to understand what that bargain is. But yes, I know, it's, I know they said that, okay. that, that you well, are doing something. Your, your point is well made. We heard you, and we will continue to make our efforts to, to, to show the cost containment and to show both FTA and the PMO. Any other uh, things you want to highlight on the PMO report? Any other questions, members? If not, before I lose quorum, Jill, <laughs> let's go to you and your presentation of the new monthly report. Members, we've also changed the monthly report. So, Jill, why don't you proceed? Uh, because of the feedback um, from both yourself and um, uh, uh, Director uh, Formby, um, we, we heard you say that you depend more on the PMO report than you do on our report. Right. So we took that as we have to make ours more uh, readable uh, more user-friendly, both for the board, uh, for the elected officials, and for the public. And so um, what we've done, and my colleague, uh, Jill Odo, is, is the one who manages this, um, we've gone through and we're going to reduce the number of pages. But not only that, we're going to uh, make sure that we get the information that's most meaningful to you and have it um, uh, right out in front for you. And um, if I could, um, I'd like Jill to run through a few notes. Okay. Hi, Jill Odo, uh, management analyst with Project Controls. Uh, so as Sam was mentioning, we took a deep thought into how we can put up cost schedule and key issues in, in the report in a readable manner. We also had to balance the fact that the PMOC, this is their a report for them, so they do need certain things in the report. So we touched base with them, we touched base with Michael Formby, and we tried to come to a, a happy medium for all the various audiences. So we removed unnecessary graphs and tables and images. Um, in an effort to lighten up the report, but also just keep our focus on important issues. Uh, so there will be some changes that will be coming in September and October. We're going to be rolling it out over the next couple of months. And for the contract pages, we will actually be including a box at the very top of the contract pages, which will highlight the cost and schedule for each respective contract, so you can see immediately what's going on with those. Uh, we will also be compiling the critical path issues with the key issues section so that there will just be one consolidated area for all of the contract's key issues. We'll also be adding in another portion for key milestones so we can track what the upcoming milestones are and, and what's going on with them. Overall, we will also be adding in a contract status table that will combine information that was previously in two separate sections of the report. So it will have information on uh, cost information for contracts as well as when contracts are expected to complete. So instead of having to look at two different areas, you can see it in one quick area. And in terms of key issues, we're going to be moving that, that section up for certain areas such as safety and security and quality management since these are such uh, important aspects of the project. Are there any questions? Any questions, members? The one thing I do want to thank you for, Jill, is one of the things that has always bothered me in the presentation of the status, uh, the progress report, is that when we talked about Wolf contract, for example, we never used to, I think, acknowledge that it doesn't begin with the FFGA, so that it really began as a $482 million contract. And if you notice, even in our um, 11 by 17, the amount for the Wolf contract is $542,135,144. Whereas in yours, it is, I think, correctly reflected as the original contract is $482,924. The reason this was significant before 
was when we used to have reports to the board, if you take the higher figure, our change order percentage is a lot smaller than what it really was. And uh, you know, you're, we, we lost in the process something like 80 something million dollars because that was a change order from the original contract to the what we were reporting. So I think that that's still something that, especially on the pre-heart contract, Sam, we need to recognize so that we have a clear understanding of the growth of that contract amount. So thank you very much to you, Jill, for reflecting it correctly. Anyone else? No? Thank you very much. Chair, yes. if I could just quickly make one sentence. I don't mean to extend this. Uh, one of the items that we skipped over was the status of the electrical substation at, at the um, right. rail. We, we haven't skipped over it. I oh. just decided to. Oh, okay. Since you are here, we'll take you. Oh. So we will go back. Um, okay. and I, I'm just debating whether we should hear from our acting executive director. He's saying no, so I guess I can skip over him. <laughs> I can go back. Yeah, I'm happy to speak in October. Okay. <laughs> we charge for swan songs. Okay, thank you. So we will go back and let's, um, of, the, um, of the remaining issues, Sam, um, before I lose quorum, uh, and I'm, I think I may be losing it very shortly. Do you think we should do that or uh, go back to Council Bill 53? Shall we go to rail, uh, the rail operations center? I can do it very quickly. Okay, why don't we do that? I see uh, <laughs> the director for Jigami putting his things together, so I'm going to lose him after you, so okay. quickly. On, on September 9th, uh, uh, our um, deputy executive director, Brendan Marioko, um, uh, Chris um, Takashigi, the director of design and construction, and myself, uh, went to um, UH, met with Mark Lane, the vice chancellor for um, uh, v um, LCC, and with Carlton Ching, um, who's the uh, UH um, Director of Land Development, uh, met with them, discussed our concerns, our challenge and everything, and uh, they were very agreeable to us having the electrical substation on a plot of land that's a remnant at the top of um, uh, uh, their area right next to the um, LCC station. So it was, they were very cooperative about it. So. That's that because that would alleviate your concern about building an electrical substation on a piece of property that um, we don't have final deed on yet. Well, no, the issue was whether we could comply with HECO's requirement according to the tariff that right. you must you must deed them the land. So I assume that this means that they will they meaning UH or whoever is the owner of that parcel of land will be willing to deed that parcel to Hawaiian Electric so that they can file their, basically their docket, to open the docket with the PUC. I'm sorry, that, then I, I wasn't the uh, uh, lead person on that discussion, but we did not agree to that. Oh, okay. okay? It, and I, think, I think that was the issue. Chris, do you have a different understanding of the opening of the docket of the 46 KV? No, that's correct. Um, but. Um, UH does know about that requirement, about the tariff and the details of the tariff, and so um, I'm, I'm pretty sure, pretty confident they would be comfortable dealing that over. To the, to, that's the only thing that held it up, uh, as I understood it, is that they, under the tariff, HECO must have the fee of underlying the 46 KV substation, because we need them to open that docket and to pay for it. So, thank you, thank you very much. Ford, do you have to leave? Yes. Okay. Sorry. So members, um, and uh, sorry to everyone else, but we are going to lose our quorum at this point. Thank you very much for, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, um, members, we will uh, adjourn this meeting, and we may be reconvening to a date in October, so please, before the next meeting, so to the members of the public, please watch. Yes, Jesse. He's got to go. Uh, okay. For Jesse, I'll sneak. All right. I didn't well. gavel out, so hurry up. <laughs> this is this is for the item that um, is about the resolution from council regarding acquisition. Uh, 
16-169? Yes, it's um, item 8. Oh, right, 13. Right. 13, 13. Right. So basically, I don't think the board needs to take an action, but what we wanted the board to consider was given council's position that they recommitted that um, bill to a resolution to committee, right. and it's basically going to be deferred. Um, we've um, spoken with Council Member Kobayashi and we're providing her with the information she needs and so she, she's um, happy with what we're doing and how we're going to work with landowners moving forward with acquisition. Um, also what you heard about the visit with FTA, um, I'm not sure if um, 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 they mentioned that one of the things FTA said was that they are okay if we move forward with acquisition down city center. So we wanted with that new information if the board would consider um, repealing their resol on the acquisition of property in city center. And if that was the case, then we draft a resolution for your consideration that you can look at at the next meeting. Why don't you give it for us for the next meeting and we can have that discussion at that time. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you thank for... Thank you very much. Members, thank you very much. This is one of the quickest meetings we've had. So... We are adjourned until that. And as I said, please watch because we may have a special meeting in sometime in the week of October 17th. Thank you very much.